My name is Silas Eddings, and this happened to me on October 13, 1984, in the thick woods near Sable Rock, Arkansas. I remember it because I was out there alone, doing what I loved most, tracking wildlife deep in the forest. I was 28, living in a small town called Harper's Mill, and I spent my days as a park ranger. But more than that, I was an outdoorsman, drawn to the wilderness the way most people are drawn to the comforts of home. I'd go days without seeing another person, just me, my gear, and miles of untamed land. I grew up in a quiet family. My mother was a librarian, my father worked at the sawmill. The woods were in my blood, you could say. They had their secrets, and I respected that. I'd had my fair share of run-ins with bears and the occasional aggressive buck, but I'd learned their patterns, their habits. I knew how to stay out of trouble, how to avoid startling them. But that year, in October, something happened that I still can't fully understand. That day started like any other. I packed my gear, some jerky, a canteen of water, and my father's old hunting knife, just in case. I had a small revolver too, a .38 Smith & Wesson, but it was more for comfort than anything else. I'd seen some odd things in the woods over the years, sure, but they were usually easy enough to explain. But on that particular day, something strange was waiting for me. It was around midday when I first felt it, a prickling on the back of my neck, a cold shiver that made no sense in the stillness of the October air. The leaves were crisp underfoot a carpet of reds and yellows, and the sun filtered through the canopy in soft patches. I was following a trail, one I knew well, marked by a big old oak that had a split trunk. I had passed it a dozen times before without a second thought, but this time, something felt off. I can't explain it any better than that. Just a feeling, an unease that hung in the air like fog. I shrugged it off at first. The woods can mess with your mind if you let them. The rustling of leaves, a bird flapping its wings, even the creak of an old tree, alone, each sound was harmless. But put them all together, and you start to imagine things, see shadows in places they don't belong. I pushed on, but the feeling only grew stronger. My pulse quickened as I stepped carefully around a fallen log, my hand instinctively brushing the handle of my knife. I was a mile or two deep by then, far enough that the road was a distant memory, and Harper's Mill felt like another world. That's when I saw the tracks. They were fresh, imprinted in the soft earth. Too big for a wolf, yet not quite right for a bear. I knelt down, my fingers brushing the edge of one print. It was broad, almost paw-like, but with toes that were longer than any animal I'd seen in Arkansas. Each toe ended in a deep groove, like a claw had sunk into the ground. The hair on my arm stood up. I knew every animal in these woods, their tracks, their sounds. But this, this was different. It was out of place, wrong somehow. My first thought was that someone was out here with some exotic pet that had no business being in Arkansas. But then I noticed something else. The track wasn't alone. There was another set, smaller but equally strange, and the prints moved in a winding pattern, as if whatever had made them had been circling, stalking. I felt a chill trickle down my spine, but I told myself it was just a cougar or maybe some oversized bobcat. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I could feel it in my bones. I followed the tracks for a while, more out of curiosity than anything else. I kept my steps quiet careful, the way you do when you know something's watching you. I found myself breathing slower, quieter, trying to match the rhythm of the forest around me. The woods had gone silent, the way they sometimes do when a predator's nearby. That's when I saw it. Just ahead, in a clearing, there was something hunched low to the ground, gnawing on what looked like the remains of a deer. Its skin was a sickly gray, stretched taut over a wiry frame. It had no fur, just thin, mottled skin that clung to its bones. It moved with an unsettling, jerky rhythm, like it wasn't entirely in control of its own limbs. I froze, 
barely breathing, watching it from behind a tree. Its head was tilted at an unnatural angle, and I could see the gleam of sharp teeth as it tore into the carcass. My first thought was to back away, to leave it to whatever it was doing. But as I shifted my weight, a twig snapped underfoot. The creature's head shot up, and it looked right at me. Its eyes were pitch black, empty pits that seemed to suck in the light around them. For a moment, we were both frozen, locked in a silent standoff. Then it snarled, a low, guttural sound that sent a spike of fear straight through me. It rose slowly, its limbs unfolding in a way that seemed, wrong. Its movements were jerky, unnatural, as if it were unused to its own body. Instinct kicked in, and I backed away, keeping my eyes on it. I could feel my heartbeat pounding in my ears, my hand clutching the handle of my knife. The creature took a step forward, its gaze fixed on me, unblinking. There was an intelligence in those black eyes, something that went beyond animal instinct. It was studying me, sizing me up. My mind raced. I knew I couldn't outrun it, not in these woods not with the way it moved. So I did the only thing I could think of. I pulled out my revolver and aimed it at the creature. My hand shook, but I held my ground. The creature paused, its head cocked to the side as if it were mocking me, daring me to try. I fired. The shot echoed through the trees, a sharp crack that shattered the silence. The creature staggered, but it didn't fall. Instead, it let out an enraged hiss, a sound that made my skin crawl, and lunged toward me. I stumbled back, my heart hammering as I fired again, but it barely slowed the thing down. Its clawed hand reached out, swiping at me, and I felt a sharp pain as its claws raked across my arm. The force knocked me off balance, and I hit the ground hard, my revolver skittering out of reach. Panic surged through me as I scrambled backward my fingers brushing against the handle of my knife. I gripped it tight, my eyes locked on the creature as it stalked closer, its mouth twisted into a grotesque grin. It crouched down, preparing to strike, and I knew I had only seconds left. With a burst of adrenaline, I lunged forward, swinging the knife with all my strength. The blade sank into its side, and the creature let out a howl of pain, its body twisting in agony. I didn't stop. I drove the knife deeper, twisting it until the creature finally released its grip, staggering back with a guttural hiss. I seized the opportunity, grabbing my revolver and firing once more, this time hitting it square in the chest. The creature collapsed to the ground, its body convulsing as a dark, viscous fluid seeped from the wound. I didn't wait to see if it was dead. I turned and ran, my breath ragged my body aching, but I didn't stop until I was back at the edge of the woods, the sun setting behind me. When I finally looked back, the forest was quiet again, the only sound my own labored breathing. Whatever that creature had been, it was gone, swallowed up by the shadows of the trees. I stood there, knife still clutched in my hand, blood trickling from the gashes on my arm, and for the first time, I felt a chill that went deeper than any October wind. I'm Travis Gibson, a wildlife researcher in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and this happened to me on October 9, 1987. I've spent the better part of my life studying the migration patterns of the black bear population in Virginia. It's a solitary job, but that's the way I like it. I've always been more comfortable with animals than people. My colleagues joke about my ability to spend weeks in the wilderness with just a tent and a notebook. But this particular fall, things went wrong in a way I never could have imagined. I was stationed near Mount Rogers for a three-week stint. The plan was simple, hike deep into the forest, set up trail cams, and observe the bears as they prepared for hibernation. The terrain was rough but manageable, and the weather, while chilly, wasn't anything I hadn't dealt with before. I had a good tent, plenty of supplies, and enough firewood to last the whole trip. The solitude didn't bother me, it never did. But something felt different this time. 
the forest was quieter than usual. There was no wind, no rustling of leaves, no distant howls of coyotes. Even the usual chorus of birds seemed absent. I figured it was the change in season, that maybe the animals had already hunkered down early. Still, the silence was unnerving. Every crack of a branch seemed louder than it should have been, every shadow just a bit too dark. On the third night, I woke to the sound of something rummaging around my camp. Bears are common enough in the area, and I assumed one had caught wind of my food. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out of the tent cautiously, armed with my bear spray. But what I saw wasn't a bear. Standing just outside the glow of my dying campfire was a figure. At first, I thought it was a person, maybe another hiker lost in the woods. But something was off. The figure was tall, unnaturally tall, and gaunt. Its skin looked leathery, like it had been stretched too tight over bones. It didn't move, didn't speak, just stood there watching me. I raised my flashlight, but the beam barely seemed to touch it, like the light was absorbed by the darkness surrounding it. Hey! You okay? I called, though my voice was shaky. No response. Just that eerie, motionless stare. I backed into my tent, my heart pounding. The figure didn't follow, but I could feel its eyes on me through the fabric. I didn't sleep that night, every sound sending my nerves into overdrive. When morning came, the figure was gone, and I convinced myself it had been a trick of the light, a product of my isolation playing tricks on my mind. The next few days, I tried to focus on my work. I hiked farther from camp, setting up trail cams and checking the footage. But the cameras weren't capturing anything. No bears, no deer, not even the usual squirrels. Just static, like something was interfering with the equipment. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every time I turned around, I half expected to see that figure standing there, just out of reach. By the end of the week, I was ready to cut the trip short. But that night, it returned. I was in my tent, trying to sleep, when I heard it again, the soft crunch of footsteps in the leaves. I grabbed my flashlight and slowly unzipped the tent. The fire had burned down to embers, casting long shadows across the trees. And there it was, standing at the edge of the clearing. Closer this time, the same gaunt figure, its dark eyes fixed on me. I scrambled out of the tent, my flashlight shaking in my hand. What do you want? I shouted, but again, no response. Then it moved. The figure began to shift, its body contorting in ways that made my stomach turn. Its limbs seemed to stretch, bending at unnatural angles as it stepped toward me. I backed away fumbling for the bear spray on my belt. My hands were trembling, but I managed to raise the canister and spray it in the creature's direction. The cloud of spray should have been enough to deter a bear, let alone whatever this thing was. But it didn't flinch. The figure continued advancing, its leathery skin unaffected by the irritant. That's when I realized this wasn't something natural. This wasn't an animal, and it sure as hell wasn't human. I turned and ran. The forest seemed to close in around me as I sprinted through the trees, my flashlight bouncing wildly in the darkness. Every time I glanced back, the figure was there, moving faster than it should have been able to, its long limbs propelling it through the underbrush without a sound. It was toying with me, staying just far enough behind to keep me running but close enough to let me know it was there. My lungs burned, my legs screamed for me to stop but I couldn't. I knew if I stopped, that thing would catch me. I stumbled into a ravine, the rocks cutting into my palms as I scrambled down the slope. My foot caught on a root, and I went down hard, my flashlight skittering out of my hand and into the darkness. For a moment, I lay there, gasping for breath, listening. Nothing. Then I heard it, a low, guttural sound, like the creaking of old wood. The figure was at the top of the ravine, looking down at me. I scrambled for my flashlight, but
but it was too far. My hand closed around a rock instead, and I hurled it at the figure with all the strength I had left. It hit the creature square in the chest, but instead of recoiling, it seemed to absorb the impact. The rock sank into its body like it had been swallowed by tar. The figure tilted its head, as if curious, and then began to descend the ravine, its limbs bending and twisting in impossible ways. I was trapped. Desperation kicked in. I reached into my pack for the hunting knife I always carried and held it out in front of me, though I knew it wouldn't do much good. The figure was almost on top of me now, its dark eyes staring into mine. I could feel the weight of its presence pressing down on me, suffocating, like the air itself was thickening. Then, in a final, desperate act, I lunged. The knife sank into the creature's side, and for the first time, it reacted. A horrible, ear-piercing screech filled the air as the figure recoiled, its body twisting away from me. I scrambled to my feet and ran again, this time not looking back. I didn't stop until I reached the edge of the forest, the first rays of dawn breaking through the trees. I never went back to that campsite. I left my tent, my supplies, everything. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't something I wanted to face again. The authorities didn't believe me, of course. They said it was probably a bear, or that I was hallucinating from exhaustion. But I know what I saw. I know what was out there. Later, after some research, I found something. An old Appalachian legend about a creature called the Wampus Cat, a shapeshifter that could take the form of a half-woman, half-beast. It was said to stalk the forests, hunting those who wandered too far from safety. I don't know if that's what I encountered, but I do know one thing, I'm never going back into those woods. Whatever it was, it's still out there. And it's watching. My name is Alden Warwick, and this happened to me on November 17, 1984, in the Washita National Forest. It was meant to be a week-long solo hike through the dense Arkansas wilderness, a getaway from my usual routine and the busyness of city life. I was no stranger to the outdoors. Growing up in a small town with miles of forest as my backyard, I'd spent countless hours trekking through woods, exploring every hidden corner. But even with years of experience, I'd never felt as uneasy as I did that cold November evening. The forest was quieter than usual the kind of silence that presses on your ears and makes every rustling leaf seem louder than it should. I'd set up camp near a small clearing, close enough to a creek that I could fill my canteen easily. It was remote, just the way I liked it. I wasn't one for crowded trails or noisy campsites. For me, the wilderness was an escape, a place where I could breathe without distraction. I was sitting by my fire warming my hands and watching the shadows dance on the tree trunks around me. The flames crackled, casting flickers of light that barely caught through the surrounding dark. That's when I heard it, a sound that didn't belong in the forest. It was a low, rhythmic drumming, like the distant thump of large, steady footsteps. My first thought was bear, they're common enough in these parts, and a black bear looking for an easy meal might wander into a campsite but the sound wasn't right. Bears are quiet, almost silent, when they move. Whatever was making this sound was heavy, deliberate. Each step seemed to echo, reverberating through the forest floor, drawing closer. I grabbed my flashlight, pointing it toward the sound, though it barely cut through the dense blackness of the trees. I didn't see anything at first, just the impenetrable shadow. Then, as I strained to listen, the footsteps stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. It was as if the forest itself held its breath. I shrugged it off, telling myself it was nothing, maybe just a branch breaking under its own weight, a deer moving through the brush. The logical part of me tried to rationalize it, but something in my gut told me to stay alert. I kept my flashlight within reach, along with the hunting knife strapped to my belt a habit I'd picked up from my father, who always told me, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. 
the fire crackled lower as the night went on, and I eventually drifted off to sleep in my tent, though it was a light, restless kind of sleep. Hours passed, and I don't know what time it was when I woke, but it was still dark. The forest outside was deathly quiet, and I felt an inexplicable sense of dread, the kind that tightens in your chest and makes you wish you were anywhere but there. Then, I heard it again, the rhythmic footsteps, closer this time. The sound was slow and deliberate, each step heavy enough to shake the ground beneath me. I felt every footfall as if it was hammering in my own chest. I stayed still, listening, my hand instinctively reaching for the knife by my side. The footsteps circled my tent, moving slowly, methodically. I couldn't bring myself to move, barely dared to breathe, my mind racing through every possibility. Maybe it was a poacher, someone trying to mess with me. But poachers don't make noise like that, they're stealthy, sneaky. Whoever, or whatever, this was, it wanted to be heard. I took a steadying breath and tightened my grip on the knife. If this was someone playing games, I wasn't going to be an easy target. Slowly, I unzipped the tent, trying not to make a sound. My flashlight was in my other hand, ready to blind whoever was outside. As the zipper inched open, the footsteps stopped, the forest falling silent once more. I counted to three in my head, then burst out of the tent, flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. The clearing was empty, nothing but trees casting long shadows under the faint moonlight. But the silence hung heavy, unnatural, as if something had just been there, only to vanish the moment I looked. I was breathing hard, adrenaline making my hands shake as I scanned the tree line. I saw nothing, no movement, no eyes watching from the dark. Slowly, I backed toward the fire pit, keeping my eyes on the trees, straining to catch any hint of movement. Then, just as I was about to retreat to my tent, a glint of something caught my eye, a faint, reflective surface hanging from a nearby branch. I stepped closer, shining my flashlight on it, and felt a chill run down my spine. It was a set of feathers, black and sleek, tied together with what looked like strands of sinew. There was something distinctly unsettling about it, an object that didn't belong there, like a dark omen left as a warning. The feathers were ranged in a way that reminded me of old folklore, tales I'd heard from my grandmother about spirits and creatures that lurked in the deep woods. She used to talk about beings. That could shapeshift, creatures that wore the faces of animals but walked like men, the kind of tales I'd brushed off as bedtime stories. I left the feather charm hanging there, feeling a growing urge to pack up and leave. But pride, or maybe just plain stubbornness, kept me rooted to that spot. I wasn't going to let some creepy charm drive me out of the woods. So, I stoked the fire back to life and sat close to it, my back to a large rock, knife in hand, and flashlight resting on my knee. The footsteps returned, louder and closer pounding like a heartbeat in the stillness. My eyes darted around, scanning the dark between the trees. And that's when I saw it, a figure, just barely illuminated by the firelight, standing at the edge of the clearing. It looked like a man at first glance, tall and thin, draped in something that shifted and blended into the shadows. But as it moved closer, I realized that what I'd mistaken for clothing was actually a kind of thick, black fur covering its body. Its face was shrouded in darkness, but I could make out glinting eyes, cold and calculating, watching me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. The creature took a step forward, its movement slow, deliberate, as if testing me, studying my reaction. I gripped my knife tighter, not daring to blink as it advanced. When it stopped just outside the reach of the firelight, it tilted its head, almost like it was curious, sizing me up. Without thinking, I shouted, stay back. My voice echoed through the trees, startling a few birds from their roosts. The creature didn't flinch, didn't move, but I felt a flicker of something, amusement, maybe, in its gaze. It was as if my words meant nothing to it, a mere inconvenience. Then, it opened its mouth, and a sound, low and resonant, filled the air. 
It was a sound I can barely describe, somewhere between a growl and a whisper, carrying with it a weight that made my blood run cold. I realized, with a sinking feeling, that this was no animal, no person. This was something else, something ancient and malevolent. Instinct took over, and I did the only thing I could think of, I threw my flashlight directly at its head. The creature dodged, moving faster than I could track, a blur of motion that barely seemed real. In the next second, it lunged forward, and I barely managed to bring my knife up in time. It was stronger than anything I'd ever faced, and each swipe of its clawed hand pushed me further back, closer to the fire. My mind raced as I fought to keep it at bay, the flames flickering, casting distorted shadows of our struggle. I knew I couldn't keep this up for long, it was only a matter of time before my strength failed. Desperation pushed me to make a risky move. I backed up until my foot touched a thick branch I'd set aside for firewood. In one swift motion, I swung it, catching the creature off guard. It stumbled back, giving me a brief moment of reprieve. Seizing the chance, I grabbed a burning stick from the fire and thrust it toward the creature, hoping the flames would drive it off. The creature recoiled, hissing, its eyes flashing with a hatred that cut through me like a knife. But it didn't retreat, instead, it circled me, just out of reach, as if waiting for me to slip, to make one wrong move. I could feel exhaustion weighing on me, each breath coming harder than the last. The fire crackled beside me, my only defense against this thing that seemed to draw strength from the darkness itself. The creature paced around me, eyes locked on mine, as if calculating its next move. Every muscle in my body was tense, my grip tight around the makeshift torch. I knew I couldn't keep this up forever. If I was going to make it out of this, I'd have to end it quickly. The flames danced in my hand, casting wild shadows across the clearing, and an idea began to form. I waited, forcing myself to stay calm, watching the creature's movements. It was quick, too quick to predict, but it hesitated each time the fire flared up. There was fear in its gaze, a weariness of the flames that made it hold back. I couldn't overpower it physically, but if I could use its fear to my advantage, maybe I'd have a chance. I took a deep breath, steadying myself, then suddenly threw the burning branch at the creature's face. It dodged, but I lunged forward, grabbing another branch and thrusting it toward its chest, driving it back. It hissed and snarled, its movements frantic as it tried to avoid the flames. With each swing, I pushed it further away from the fire, forcing it toward the edge of the clearing. The creature's confidence wavered its movements more erratic as it tried to escape the relentless onslaught of fire. I could see it in its eyes, a flicker of doubt, a realization that it might not win this fight. Then, with one last desperate lunge, I plunged the burning stick into its side. The creature let out an unearthly scream, a sound so piercing it made the hair on my arm stand on end. It thrashed, its limbs flailing as it stumbled backward, engulfed in flames. I watched, breathing hard, as it staggered into the trees, its body writhing as the fire consumed it. The flames lit up the forest, casting an eerie glow that illuminated the creature's twisted form as it vanished into the darkness, leaving behind only the faint scent of smoke and charred fur. Silence settled over the clearing, broken only by the crackling of the fire. I stood there, gripping the remnants of my makeshift torch my heart pounding as I tried to process what had just happened. I didn't know what that thing was, and I wasn't sure I wanted to. All I knew was that I was alive, and whatever that creature had been, it was gone, at least for now. Without wasting another second, I gathered my things, doused the fire, and left the clearing. As I made my way back through the forest, the weight of the encounter settled in. I'd survived but something told me that the woods held far more secrets than I'd ever understand. And some things, I realized, were better left undisturbed. I'm Nolan Reed, and I'm a wildlife researcher, based out of a small field station near the southern end of the Appalachian Trail. 
This happened on November 3, 1992, while I was tracking a group of black bears. The fall season had just started to give way to winter, and the mornings were cold enough that frost coated the underbrush. It was a quiet time of year, just before the hunters started crowding the woods and long after the summer hikers had packed up their tents. A perfect time for me to be alone in the wilderness, gathering data for a population study on the region's wildlife. I love that isolation, the peace that came with it. Or at least, I thought I did. That particular day started like any other. I'd camped overnight on the ridge and woke up to the sound of wind sweeping through the trees. My tent was damp with condensation, and the ground underneath had become hard as stone. The bears I'd been tracking for weeks were somewhere near the valley below, where I was headed. I packed up camp quickly, making a mental note of my progress. The radio was dead, again. Not uncommon. I hadn't managed to check in with the station since yesterday, but it didn't concern me much. It wouldn't be the first time the equipment failed out here. I took my time as I descended the ridge, scanning for the bear's tracks, stopping to listen every now and then for any movement. But the woods were silent. Too silent. It was the kind of quiet that makes your skin prickle with unease, like everything around you had decided to hold its breath. I tried to shake the feeling off. I was used to being alone out here, after all. But I wasn't alone. I didn't realize it at first, though. I made it about two miles down the trail when I spotted something strange. A man standing on the far side of the creek. His clothes were rough-looking, a plaid jacket and jeans, but what struck me was the way he stood, perfectly still, arms at his sides, watching me. I hadn't seen anyone in days, and for someone to be out here, so deep in the woods without any gear or a sign of a camp, it felt off. I lifted a hand in a wave, figuring he must be lost. Hey, I called, my voice carrying through the empty forest. You all right? No response. He didn't move. I paused, my feet rooted to the spot. Something about the way he looked at me, no, through me, made my stomach twist. Are you lost? I tried again, louder this time. Still nothing. I could feel my pulse quicken as the man remained there, motionless, like a statue. The sun was still low, casting long shadows between the trees, and the cold air stung my lungs with every breath. I could have sworn the temperature dropped several degrees since I spotted him. I considered crossing the creek to help, but something deep inside me warned against it. Instead, I turned and walked back the way I'd come, trying to ignore the feeling of being watched. My pace quickened as I moved, and soon enough, I found myself practically jogging back toward the ridge. The ground was uneven, my boots sliding on patches of frost and loose leaves, but I kept going. Then, the snapping of branches echoed from behind me. It wasn't far. It wasn't a bear. I turned eyes darting through the trees, but saw nothing. The man was gone. But the feeling lingered, that same gnawing sense of being watched, of being followed. I pulled the radio from my pack, clicking the button over and over in desperation, but all I got was static. I tried again. Base, this is Reed, come in. Do you copy? Nothing. Just static. The ridge was still a good mile away, but my legs were on autopilot now, carrying me forward with a sense of urgency I couldn't shake. Then, out of nowhere, I heard it again. Footsteps, crunching through the underbrush. Closer this time. I stopped dead in my tracks, my heart pounding in my chest, and scanned the woods around me. Hello? I called out, my voice trembling despite my best effort to stay calm. No response. Just the wind, whispering through the trees, and the eerie silence that followed. I stood there, frozen, for what felt like minutes but was likely only a few seconds. And then I saw him, closer this time. He was maybe thirty yards away, standing partially obscured by a tree, 
staring at me again. His face, there was something wrong with his face. Pale, too pale for someone who'd been out in the elements, with eyes that looked sunken and hollow, almost like they belonged to a corpse. I didn't wait to find out more. I bolted. I ran harder than I'd ever run in my life, not caring about the trail or the direction, just needing to put as much distance between myself and him as possible. The pounding of my boots on the dirt was loud in my ears, my breath coming in ragged gasps, and I could hear him, those footsteps behind me, matching my pace. He wasn't running, though. Just walking. But somehow, he was always just as close, always there. I crashed through the trees, the underbrush scratching at my legs and arms, until I came to a dead stop at the creek. The water was icy, fast-moving, and deeper than I remembered. I looked back, but he was gone again. The forest behind me was empty. For a moment, I let myself believe I'd lost him. That's when I felt the cold press of a knife against my throat. I froze, the breath leaving my lungs in a panicked gasp. His hand was on my shoulder now, strong and calloused, and I could feel the blade digging into my skin, not enough to draw blood, but enough to let me know he could. My mind raced, heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst. How did he get so close? I hadn't heard a thing. Why are you here? His voice was low, gravelly, barely more than a whisper, but it was enough to send a chill down my spine. I didn't answer at first. My brain couldn't catch up with what was happening. Then the knife pressed harder, and I knew I didn't have a choice. I'm just tracking bears, I managed to choke out, my voice shaking. I am a researcher. Liar, he hissed, and the knife slid an inch higher, close enough that I could feel the cold metal under my chin. I've seen you before. Watching. My heart skipped a beat. He wasn't talking about the bears. I don't know what you're talking about, I stammered, trying to keep my voice steady, trying not to make any sudden moves. He leaned in closer, his breath hot against my neck, and I caught a whiff of something rotten. The knife moved again, but this time, instead of pressing harder, it pulled away. I felt a strange mix of relief and terror, my muscles tensing as I prepared to make a break for it but he didn't give me the chance. In one swift motion, he grabbed me by the collar of my jacket and shoved me forward, hard. I stumbled into the creek, the freezing water soaking my legs and nearly knocking me off balance. By the time I regained my footing and turned around, he was gone. The woods were silent again, but not in the same way as before. It was the kind of silence that comes after a storm, the kind that makes you feel like something is watching from just beyond the tree line. I didn't wait around to find out what. I scrambled up the creek bank, drenched and shaking, and ran as fast as my legs would carry me back toward the ridge. I didn't stop until I reached my camp, where I collapsed in a heap beside my gear, gasping for air. The sun was beginning to set by the time I finally got the radio working again. I reported what had happened trying to keep my voice steady as I explained everything to the rangers back at the station. They promised to send someone to check the area, but I could tell they didn't believe me. Who would? By the time the rangers arrived, there was no sign of the man. No footprints, no disturbed underbrush, nothing. Just me, standing there, still drenched and shaking, trying to make sense of what had happened. They found nothing but I knew he was still out there. And so, I left. My name is Andrew Voss, and this happened to me on November 5, 1989, in a remote stretch of woods outside Packwood, Washington. I'd been hiking these trails for years, usually to clear my mind, to get a break from the responsibilities back in Seattle. My job as a project manager kept me inside and glued to deadlines, so any chance to hit a trail and lose myself in the smell of pine and earth was one I never passed up. But that year, things were different. I was coming off a brutal stretch of work, my boss was riding me hard, 
and my only thought was to get as far from people as possible, somewhere out where cell phones wouldn't reach and nobody knew my name. I arrived in Packwood around noon, with only a few hikers scattered around. It was the off-season, after all. The air was cold, and the skies were that familiar shade of overcast gray you get in Washington in November. I parked my old Toyota a mile from the trailhead, threw on my pack, and set off, planning to cover a few miles before nightfall. I knew these woods well enough to navigate without markers, and I'd brought a map, compass, and flashlight just in case. I'd been on the trail for about an hour when I noticed the silence. Not the usual quiet of a forest, but an unsettling stillness, no rustling leaves, no calls from distant birds, not even the hum of an insect. It was as if something had stilled the whole forest, pressing pause on every living thing around me. I kept moving, brushing it off as the natural sound dampening that came with the mist settling in the trees, but the feeling lingered, creeping under my skin and making the hair on the back of my neck prickle. By late afternoon, I had made my way up to a ridge that gave me a panoramic view of the valley. I stopped to take it all in, admiring the way the mist clung to the trees in waves, moving like it had a life of its own. That's when I noticed something unusual. Down in the valley, among the trees, was a flash of movement, quick and almost hidden by the foliage. My first thought was a deer or maybe a bear, but something about its shape and the way it moved didn't sit right with me. It was too tall, too human-like. I strained my eyes, trying to catch another glimpse, but the movement was gone, swallowed by the mist. Shrugging it off as my mind playing tricks, I continued down the trail. I'd hiked far enough that turning back would take me the better part of two hours, so I decided to make camp for the night. I found a small clearing with some fallen logs, set up my tent, and started a fire to ward off the growing chill. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the forest around me grew even quieter, leaving only the crackle of my fire and the occasional snap of a twig somewhere in the distance. It was around midnight when I woke to a faint sound outside my tent, a low, rhythmic scraping, like something being dragged across the ground. My hand instinctively reached for my flashlight, and I clicked it on, casting a narrow beam of light through the tent fabric. I could make out shadows shifting just outside, but nothing definite. My mind ran through logical explanations, maybe it was just a raccoon digging around, or the wind knocking branches against each other. Summoning what courage I could, I unzipped the tent flap and shone my light into the darkness. The beam fell on the ground where my fire had been, now reduced to glowing embers, casting an eerie red glow across the clearing. The ground was covered in a thin layer of frost, and there, just beyond the reach of the embers, were tracks. They were larger than any I'd seen, long, thin, almost human but with a strange gait, as if whatever made them walked on the balls of its feet and dragged something behind. I felt a surge of unease but forced myself to step out, telling myself I was just imagining things. I scanned the area with my flashlight, moving the beam slowly to catch any movement. I saw nothing, just trees and shadows stretching endlessly into the forest. But the feeling, that prickling sense of being watched, had returned, stronger than ever. I crawled back into my tent, though sleep was the last thing on my mind. I lay there, clutching my flashlight, every nerve on edge, straining to hear anything beyond the pounding of my heart. Hours passed, and eventually, exhaustion won out, pulling me into a fitful sleep. At first light, I packed up quickly, my sense of peace shattered. I kept moving, keeping to the main trail and marking every landmark, feeling foolish but unable to shake the feeling that something wasn't right. By noon, I was nearing a section of the trail that led down into a valley with denser trees and less visibility. I hesitated, remembering the movement I'd seen the day before, but forced myself to press on, convincing myself it was all in my head. I'd barely gone a few hundred feet into the valley when I saw it, a figure, standing just off the trail. It was tall, maybe six and a half feet, with a strange, hunched posture that made its arms hang low. 
Its skin was an unnatural shade of gray, and its face. I can't even describe it properly. It was like a blank canvas, with only faint impressions where eyes, a nose, and a mouth should be, as if it was trying to imitate a human but couldn't quite get it right. I froze, my mind racing through every logical explanation. Maybe it was someone playing a prank, some hunter who'd decided to mess with the off-season hikers. But as I stared, it began to move, not in any way I'd ever seen a human move. It was jerky, almost disjointed, as if each step was an effort, but it never took its gaze off me, following my every move with those hollow impressions for eyes. My instinct kicked in, and I bolted back up the trail, my legs pumping as fast as they could carry me. I glanced back only once, just long enough to see the thing matching my pace, moving faster than seemed possible given its unnatural gait. I pushed harder, my breath coming in ragged gasps, my heart thundering in my chest. I rounded a bend, spotting a thick fallen tree off the trail and, on impulse, dove behind it, pressing myself flat against the ground and holding my breath. The creature's footsteps grew louder, closing in until they were almost on top of me. I could feel the vibrations through the ground, a low, rhythmic pounding that resonated deep in my bones. It paused, mere feet from where I was hidden. I could hear it breathing, a strange, rattling sound like air forced through a narrow passage. My pulse hammered in my ears, every instinct screaming at me to stay still, to not even breathe. It felt like hours passed as it stood there, so close I could almost feel its presence, the weight of its gaze pressing down on me. Finally, it moved on, its footsteps fading as it continued down the trail. I lay there, paralyzed, waiting until I was sure it was gone before I dared to move. My body felt leaden as I forced myself to stand, muscles stiff and trembling. I knew I had to get back to the main trail, to put as much distance between me and that thing as possible but the forest had changed. The mist had thickened, swirling around me, distorting shapes and muffling sounds. Every shadow seemed to move, and every creak of a branch set my nerves on edge. I kept moving, forcing myself to focus on the trail, on getting out, but the sense of dread followed me, a constant weight in the back of my mind. By the time I finally broke free of the trees and stumbled onto the road where I'd parked, it was nearly dusk. I could barely keep my hands steady as I fumbled with my keys, sliding into the driver's seat and locking the doors with a relief that felt almost ridiculous. I sat there for a moment, catching my breath, feeling the weight of my own foolishness pressing down on me. But as I looked back at the tree line, I saw it, a glimpse of gray, standing just within the shadows, watching. I didn't wait. I started the engine tearing down the road without a second thought, leaving the forest and whatever was lurking in it far behind. I'm Luke Hodges, and I've been a wildlife photographer for over 20 years now. But this story isn't about capturing the beauty of nature. This happened to me on May 14, 1991, during what should have been a routine hike in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado. I'm the kind of guy who's spent more time in the backcountry than anywhere else, so when I got a call about an assignment to photograph some rare eagles nesting in a remote area of the San Juans, I didn't think twice about accepting. The client wanted exclusive shots of the region's biodiversity, but what I found was nothing I'd ever want to see again. I was in my mid-thirties back then, still full of energy and always looking for the next big adventure. I was recently divorced and if I'm being honest, the job helped me escape the mess of that part of my life. The trip was supposed to be therapeutic in a way, just me, my gear, and the wilderness. I packed light, a week's worth of food, my Canon AE-1, extra film rolls, and a Smith & Wesson revolver. It wasn't unusual to bring a gun when heading into these mountains, you never knew when you'd run into a bear or a mountain lion but what I ended up using it for was something I'll never forget. I reached the trailhead early in the morning, a crisp and clear day. It was the kind of weather that makes you feel invincible. The trail was faint, 
not marked on any map I could find, but that wasn't unusual either. Locals knew the area better than most guides, and one of them had tipped me off to where I might find the eagle nests. He didn't say much else, though, just that it was a secluded spot and warned me to be careful. His words were vague, but I brushed them off. I've been in remote areas before, and strange warnings were part of the job. Still, something about the way he said it lingered in my mind as I trekked deeper into the wilderness. The first day went by without a hitch. I made camp near a small stream, had some freeze-dried chili, and settled into my tent. The only sound was the wind through the trees and the occasional howl of coyotes in the distance. I slept fine that night, though I had a dream that I was being watched. I chalked it up to the usual nerves that come with being alone in the wild. The next day, things got stranger. I was heading uphill, pushing through thick brush and old growth when I noticed something out of place, a series of markings on a large boulder. They weren't natural, someone had carved into the rock, though the shapes didn't make any sense. It was just a jumble of lines and scratches. I took a picture of it, figuring it was some local graffiti or maybe an old miner's mark from years back, and kept moving. But the deeper I went, the more uneasy I felt. It wasn't just the remoteness of the place, which I was used to, it was the silence. Not a single bird call, no rustling from small critters in the underbrush, nothing. The kind of quiet that makes your skin crawl. By mid-afternoon, I stumbled upon a clearing. In the center was a small, dilapidated cabin, something straight out of an old western, but it was clear no one had lived there in a long time. The wood was gray and splintered, the roof sagging under its own weight. I don't know why, but I felt drawn to it. Maybe I thought I'd find something interesting inside, or maybe I just needed a break. I went closer, inspecting the place. The door was half off its hinges and the inside looked as bad as the outside, an old iron stove in the corner, a table with one leg missing, and a cot covered in rotting blankets. But what really caught my eye was a notebook lying on the table, its pages yellowed with age. I flipped it open, and what I read made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Most of the writing was illegible, smudged, water-damaged, but the parts one could make out were ramblings about someone being watched and hunted. The last few entries were especially disturbing. They mentioned a figure, a man, appearing in the woods and watching from a distance, getting closer each night. The writer claimed he tried to leave, but he wouldn't let him. I closed the notebook, stuffed it in my pack, and got out of there. Something felt wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I figured it was just my mind playing tricks after reading that nonsense. That evening, as I made camp again, I kept thinking about the notebook. The words gnawed at me. I tried to shake it off, reminding myself I had a job to do and that the mind plays tricks when you're alone in the wilderness. Still, I couldn't stop scanning the tree line, expecting to see something. But there was nothing. Just the wind. As darkness fell, I built a fire, ate dinner, and tried to settle down. I was exhausted but couldn't sleep. Every snap of a twig, every rustle in the trees, set me on edge. I told myself it was the animals, there had to be animals out there, even if I hadn't seen any. I kept my revolver close, just in case. Eventually, I drifted off. I woke to the sound of footsteps. At first, I thought it was a dream, those half-awake, half-asleep moments when you're not sure if what you're hearing is real. But then I heard them again, slow, deliberate, circling my camp. I sat up, heart racing, and grabbed my flashlight. I swept the beam across the trees, but saw nothing. The footsteps stopped. I called out, who's there? No answer, just silence. For the next hour, I sat there, clutching the flashlight in one hand and my revolver in the other, listening. Nothing. Finally, I convinced myself it had to be an animal, a deer or maybe a raccoon. But deep down, I didn't believe it. 
The steps had been too heavy, too purposeful. The next morning, I packed up quickly and decided to push on, eager to reach the spot where I was supposed to photograph the eagles. The tension in my chest didn't ease as I hiked. If anything, it got worse. Around noon, I reached a ridge overlooking a valley, and that's when I saw him. He was standing on the opposite ridge, maybe half a mile away. A man, tall and gaunt, wearing what looked like a long coat. He wasn't moving, just standing there, staring. I froze. For a moment, I thought maybe it was another hiker, but something about him was off. I raised my binoculars to get a better look, and when I focused on him, my blood ran cold. His face was pale, almost skeletal, with deep-set eyes that seemed too large for his head. And then he smiled, a wide, unnatural grin that made my stomach turn. I waved, trying to play it off, but he didn't respond. He just stood there, grinning. My hand dropped to the revolver at my side. I didn't know what this guy's deal was, but I wasn't about to wait around to find out. I turned and started walking faster, pushing through the brush, my mind racing. Every so often, I'd glance back, and he was still there, just standing on that ridge, watching me. By late afternoon, I found a spot near a rocky outcrop and set up camp. I didn't want to stop, but I needed to rest. I figured I'd lost him, or maybe he wasn't following me at all, just some crazy guy out in the wilderness. But as night fell, the feeling of being watched returned, stronger than before. I built a fire, hoping it would keep whatever was out there at bay. And then I heard it, those same deliberate footsteps, circling the camp again. I stood up, revolver in hand, and scanned the darkness. Stay back! I yelled. The footsteps stopped for a moment, then resumed, closer this time. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to see through the flickering light of the fire. Then, out of the darkness, he stepped forward. It was the man from the ridge, but up close, he looked worse, his skin pale and stretched tight over his bones, his eyes wide and unblinking. He didn't say a word, just kept that horrible grin plastered on his face. I raised the gun, my hands trembling. I said stay back. He didn't listen. He took another step forward, and I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the trees, but the man didn't flinch. He just kept walking toward me, that smile never leaving his face. I fired again, and again, but it was like the bullets weren't even touching him. Panic surged through me, and I did the only thing I could think of, I grabbed my gear and ran. I didn't stop to look back didn't care about the trail. I just ran, crashing through the underbrush, my heart hammering in my chest. I don't know how long I ran, but eventually, I stumbled and fell, scraping my hands on the rocky ground. I lay there, gasping for breath, too terrified to move. When I finally dared to look back, there was no sign of him. I waited, half expecting him to step out of the trees at any moment, but the woods were still. I didn't sleep that night. I kept the revolver clutched in my hand, my eyes darting to every shadow. When the sun finally rose, I packed up and made my way back to the trailhead as fast as I could. I didn't stop to photograph anything, didn't even care about the job anymore. I just wanted out of those mountains. I reported the incident when I got back to town, but the authorities didn't believe me. They said I was probably spooked by the isolation, maybe saw a mountain man or some drifter. But I know what I saw. That thing wasn't human, not anymore, at least. I never went back to the San Juans after that. I stuck to safer assignments, closer to civilization. But even now, years later, I can still see his face, that horrible grin burned into my memory. And sometimes, when I'm alone in the woods, I feel like he's still out there, watching, waiting. My name is Grant Evers, and this happened to me on October 13, 1987, in the backwoods of the Ozarks.
I remember the thick air, heavy with the damp scent of pine and decaying leaves, and the way it seemed to swallow up every sound but my own breathing. That day, I'd set out for a long hike alone, hoping to disconnect from the chaos of my work as a repairman in Little Rock. I wasn't reckless, though. I'd grown up hunting with my dad and had a decent respect for the woods and whatever lived out there. I parked my old truck at the edge of a logging trail, shouldered my pack, and set off on foot, planning to make a full loop before dark. My wife, Marie, wasn't thrilled about these solo treks, and I could hardly blame her. But with my brother recently passing, I needed the solitude to clear my head. My mind was crowded, and I figured a few hours of nothing but me and the trees would quiet some of the noise in there. The woods were quiet, too quiet, and as I pushed deeper into the forest, a strange stillness settled around me. Even the birds had fallen silent. I chalked it up to a change in the weather, we'd had a few hard storms roll through recently, and maybe the wildlife had shifted further uphill. Still, the silence pressed on me and it felt like something unseen was weighing down the forest around me. By early afternoon, I'd reached a dense patch of forest where the sun barely broke through the thick canopy. My gut told me to turn back then, but my pride pushed me forward. I didn't want to be the guy who drove an hour out of town just to turn back because of a feeling. I kept walking, though I couldn't shake the thought that I was being watched. Around a sharp bend in the trail, I spotted a clearing with an old stone structure sitting at its center. It was no more than a ruin, just a couple of crumbling walls, a doorway without a door, and a chimney that had long since lost its bricks. A sudden chill swept over me, even though the air was still. It was like walking into a pocket of cold that didn't belong there, like the walls were holding onto memories I had no business disturbing. I took a step toward it, curiosity gnawing at me. Maybe some old homestead? The kind settlers might have thrown up in the middle of nowhere, trying to carve out a life before the woods took it back. My dad used to talk about places like these, forgotten corners where folks had tried and failed, leaving only the bones of their efforts behind. As I stepped closer, a sharp snap echoed from behind me. I froze, every instinct telling me to stay still, and slowly scan the forest. Nothing. Just the silence, dense and unsettling. I chalked it up to an animal, maybe a deer or raccoon, and turned back to the ruin. But the sense of being watched hadn't left, and my skin prickled with the certainty that something was nearby. I decided to head back toward the truck. The sunlight was fading fast, and there was no sense in tempting fate. But as I turned, the rustling started again, this time louder coming from the trees off to my right. I squinted, trying to make out what was making the noise, but the woods had swallowed up whatever it was. My hand went to the hunting knife strapped to my belt, not that I'd ever needed to use it, but right then, it felt like a small comfort. Then, I heard something that made my blood go cold. It was a low, guttural chuckle, like someone laughing from deep within their throat, twisted and broken as though laughter didn't come naturally to them. I couldn't see anyone, but the sound slithered through the trees, thick with menace. Every hair on my body stood on end, and my instinct to get out of there kicked into overdrive. I didn't wait around to see who or what it was. I turned on my heel and started walking back, a little faster than I would have liked to admit. That laugh followed me, fading in and out, always just on the edge of hearing. I wanted to believe it was some trick of the wind or maybe an animal, but my gut screamed that whatever it was, it was something that didn't belong in these woods, or in this world. The woods seemed to close and tighter around me, and I felt like I was walking in circles, even though I knew the trail like the back of my hand. Shadows shifted with each step, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being herded, led somewhere I had no intention of going. When I finally broke into a run, the laugh turned into footsteps, heavy and deliberate, matching my pace. They grew louder, closer, the weight of them pressing down on the forest floor behind me. I didn't dare look back, my legs burning as I pushed forward, heart pounding with a primal fear I hadn't felt since I was a kid. 
Just when I thought I couldn't go any further, I stumbled out of the trees and into a small clearing. I looked around, and to my horror, I was back at the ruin. It was impossible, I'd been moving away from it, and yet here I was, right where I'd started. I backed away from the structure, knife in hand, when the footsteps stopped. The silence that followed was thick, unnatural. And then I saw it. A figure emerged from the shadows at the edge of the clearing, tall and gaunt, with limbs that seemed too long, too thin to support its weight. Its skin was gray and stretched tight over bones, like leather left to dry in the sun. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow, staring at me with an intelligence that was far from human. It let out another laugh, the sound low and grating, and took a step toward me. I held up my knife, though I knew it wouldn't do much against whatever this thing was. My mind raced, trying to think of a way out, but the creature seemed to sense my fear, savoring it. Why are you here? I managed to choke out, my voice barely a whisper. The thing tilted its head, a twisted grin spreading across its face, revealing rows of sharp, jagged teeth. It didn't speak, but its eyes conveyed a hunger, a desire that went beyond mere violence. This thing didn't just want to kill, it wanted to make me suffer. I inched backward, feeling for anything I could use, my hand brushing against the fallen branch. As the creature lunged, I swung with every ounce of strength I had catching it across the face. It let out a hiss, more annoyed than hurt, and its hand shot out, catching me by the wrist with a grip like iron. I struggled, adrenaline surging as I tried to break free, but its hold was unyielding. My vision blurred, panic clawing at the edges of my mind as I fought to pull away. The creature leaned in closer, its breath hot and rancid, a sickly sweet stench that made my stomach turn. With one last desperate attempt, I drove my knife into its arm. It recoiled, releasing me with a howl that echoed through the forest. I didn't wait to see if it would recover. I stumbled to my feet and bolted, weaving through the trees, ignoring the branches that tore at my clothes and skin. The creature gave chase, its footsteps heavy and relentless behind me, but I didn't look back. I could hear it closing in, feel its presence like a shadow looming over me, but I forced myself to keep going, driven by a primal need to survive. Just as my legs were about to give out, I broke through the tree line and into a clearing near the road where I'd parked my truck. I threw myself inside, slamming the door and fumbling with the keys. The engine roared to life, and I tore down the dirt road, not daring to look in the rearview mirror until I was miles away. Only then did I glance back, but there was nothing behind me, just the empty, silent woods, as if nothing had ever been there at all. I'm Eli Sanders, and I work as a wildlife photographer. This happened to me on July 17, 1987, deep in the mountains of northern Idaho. I was 28, still full of that restless energy trying to capture the perfect shots of the wilderness. I had been up in those mountains before, so it wasn't new territory for me. But that summer, something felt different. Maybe it was the heat that hung like a thick blanket over everything, or maybe it was the way the wind never seemed to blow up there anymore, like the air itself was holding its breath. My personal life wasn't much to talk about back then. My girlfriend had just left me, said I was too obsessed with my work, always out in the middle of nowhere with my camera instead of being home. I couldn't argue with that. Nature was where I felt most alive, where everything made sense. You didn't need to talk out there. The mountains didn't judge you. The animals just went about their business, and that's what I loved, pure and simple. I took off on this trip alone, figuring I needed some space to clear my head. I loaded up my gear and set out on a three-day hike into a place called Shadow Ridge. The area had always intrigued me, but it had a reputation. Local legends said that people went missing there every so often, but in my line of work, you hear all kinds of tall tales from the locals. It wasn't something I paid much attention to. The first day went smoothly. 
I found a good trail and hiked most of the day until I reached a clearing near a river. I made camp there, spent the evening snapping photos of the sunset as it melted into the jagged horizon. The beauty of it was surreal. I didn't feel like talking to anyone, and it was the kind of isolation that was comforting. That night, however, the forest around me felt odd. The usual hum of insects and night creatures was absent, leaving an unnerving silence that gnawed at my nerves. I chalked it up to being tired. It had been a long hike, after all. By the time I crawled into my tent, exhaustion took over, and I passed out within minutes. The second day began as most do on these kinds of trips. The sun broke through the canopy, dappling the ground with light as I packed up camp and headed deeper into the forest. The trail narrowed, and the trees grew thicker. After a few hours of walking, I began to notice something strange. There weren't any tracks. No animal prints, no signs of life. Even the birds were missing. It was like the forest had gone dead. By midday, I found myself staring at an old, weathered sign nailed to a tree. It read, Shadow Ridge, No Trespassing. The letters were faded, barely legible, and there was no fence or anything to back up the warning. Just a sign, standing there like it had been forgotten by everyone but the trees. I considered turning back, but my curiosity got the better of me. Besides, I was out there for a reason, and turning around would have felt like admitting defeat. I pushed forward. Around late afternoon, the trail I'd been following disappeared entirely. One moment it was there, the next it was just, gone. I stopped and looked around, trying to get my bearings. That's when I heard it, the first real sound all day. It was faint at first, almost like a low hum or chant, carried on the wind. I couldn't pinpoint the direction, but it was there, just on the edge of hearing. I stood frozen, every instinct telling me to leave, but something kept me planted to the spot. Suddenly, the chanting stopped, replaced by another sound, a soft, rhythmic crunch of leaves. Footsteps. Not mine, and not those of an animal. It was slow, deliberate, as though someone was walking carefully, almost mimicking the way I moved. I turned slowly, gripping the handle of the hunting knife strapped to my belt. Standing about fifty feet away, just beyond the line of trees, was a man. He looked out of place, like he didn't belong there. He was tall, gaunt, with a wild mess of dark hair and a beard that looked like it hadn't been trimmed in months. His clothes were tattered, dirty, and his eyes, his eyes were what froze me. They were dark, almost hollow, like the life had drained out of them long ago. I called out to him, asking if he was lost. He didn't answer. Instead, he took a step forward, slow and deliberate. I gripped my knife tighter, unsure of his intentions. I'm not one to scare easily, but something about him unsettled me in a way I couldn't shake. The man didn't speak. He just kept coming closer, his eyes never leaving mine. I stepped back, my mind racing with what to do next. Every rational part of me wanted to run, but I couldn't make myself move. It was like those hollow eyes were pulling me in, trapping me where I stood. That's when I noticed it, the knife in his hand. It was old, rusty, like it had seen too much use over too many years. My pulse quickened. This wasn't just some lost hiker. He had that look, the kind that told you he'd been out there too long. That maybe he had gone beyond the edge of sanity. I tried reasoning with him, offering to help but he didn't respond. His lips curled into a smile that sent a shiver down my spine. Without warning, he lunged at me, closing the distance faster than I could react. I stumbled backward, barely avoiding the swipe of his knife as it caught through the air where I had just been standing. Panic surged through me. I turned and bolted, crashing through the underbrush as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my ears. I could hear him behind me, the steady crunch of leaves growing louder. He was chasing me, and there was no time to think. All I knew was that I had to keep running. 
The forest was a blur as I sprinted through the trees, branches whipping at my face and arms. I didn't know where I was going, but anywhere was better than where I had been. My legs burned, lungs screaming for air, but I couldn't stop. Not with him behind me. After what felt like hours, I burst into a small clearing and tripped over a fallen log, hitting the ground hard. Pain shot up my leg, and for a second, I thought I was done for. I scrambled to my feet, gripping my knife, expecting to see him right behind me. But there was nothing. The forest was still again, as if the chase had never happened. My breaths came in ragged gasps as I scanned the tree line, my eyes darting from shadow to shadow. He was gone, just as suddenly as he had appeared. I didn't waste time. I limped toward a nearby rock formation, hoping it would offer some cover while I gathered my thoughts. My ankle throbbed with pain, but I couldn't afford to stop. Not yet. I stayed hidden behind the rocks for what felt like an eternity, the silence pressing in around me. My mind raced with what had just happened, trying to make sense of it all. Who was that man? Why was he out here, and what did he want from me? As I sat there, catching my breath, I noticed something strange about the rocks I was leaning against. Carved into the surface were symbols, crude, jagged marks that looked like they had been made with a knife or some other sharp object. They weren't anything I recognized, but they sent a chill through me all the same. Then, I heard it again. The footsteps. Slowly, deliberately, they approached from the trees. I clenched my knife, ready for whatever was coming. The man emerged from the shadows, his eyes locked on mine once more. This time, there was no hesitation. He was coming for me. I stood, every muscle tensed, my mind racing for a way out. He was close now, only a few feet away. I could see the crazed gleam in his eyes, the way his grip tightened on his knife. There was no running this time. I had to fight. He lunged again, but I was ready. I sidestepped, slashing at his arm as he passed. The blade connected, and he let out a guttural snarl of pain, but it didn't slow him down. He turned, swinging wildly, his knife grazing my shoulder. The pain was sharp, but it fueled my adrenaline. We circled each other, the tension between us thick in the air. I could see the madness in his eyes, the way his body twitched with every breath. This man wasn't going to stop until one of us was dead. He came at me again, and this time, I ducked under his swing, driving my knife into his side. He grunted, but didn't go down. Instead, he grabbed my wrist, twisting it painfully as he wrenched the knife from my hand. Panic surged through me as I struggled to break free. His grip was like iron, and I could feel the strength in his hands as he forced me to the ground. He raised his knife, ready to end it, but in that moment, something snapped inside me. With a surge of adrenaline, I kicked out, catching him off balance. He stumbled, giving me just enough time to grab a nearby rock. Without thinking, I swung it with all the strength I had left, connecting with the side of his head. He crumpled to the ground, his body twitching once before going still. I didn't wait to see if he was dead. I grabbed my gear and ran, limping through the trees, not stopping until I reached the safety of my car. When I finally made it back to civilization, I went straight to the police. They searched the area but found no trace of the man. No blood, no body, nothing. It was like he had never been there at all. But I know what I saw. I know what happened. And I haven't been back to Shadow Ridge since. My name is Willard Burke, and this happened to me on November 5, 1998, somewhere deep in the Allegheny National Forest. I've always been the kind of guy who finds peace in the outdoors, even if life itself doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Growing up in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, I'd spent enough time with my nose in books, reading about the strange, haunted folklore of the Appalachian region. 
but I never quite expected to come face to face with any of it. I was doing my usual November solo hike, something I started as a kind of reset every year after Halloween. This time, though, I chose to go deeper, following a trail that locals whispered about but no one seemed willing to map. They called it the Revenant's Path. The trail was rugged and barely recognizable in some spots, choked by overgrown roots and fallen branches. The forest around it was dense, filled with dark oaks and hemlocks whose limbs twisted like gnarled fingers. I'd always loved the way the Alleghenies felt alive, like they held memories in their roots. The weather that morning was typical for Pennsylvania in November, cold, with a steady drizzle that seeped through my jacket. I'd been hiking for hours, my thoughts getting lost in the quiet, muted colors of the season. But as the sun began its descent, a strange, unsettling quiet settled around me. No birds, no wind. It was as if the forest was holding its breath, and for the first time, I felt a pang of unease. There was a reason no one came out here, I thought, though I couldn't put my finger on what it was. The first sign that something was wrong happened around dusk. I was passing a clearing when I spotted it, an old, crumbling cabin just a few yards off the trail. I hadn't seen it before on any map, and I thought I knew every inch of these woods. The structure was barely standing, held together by rot and weathered beams that leaned like old men after a storm. Against my better judgment, I decided to check it out. I figured I could use the shelter for the night, seeing as how it was getting darker and colder by the minute. Pushing open the door, I felt a shiver that had nothing to do with the chill in the air. The interior was stripped bare, with only a few remnants of furniture left, a table with a single, rusty lantern and a small cot in the corner covered in a thin layer of mildew. The air was thick, smelling of damp wood and decay. I scanned the room, hoping to find something that could tell me about whoever used to live here. But what I found sent a jolt of terror through my chest. On the wall, scratched into the wood, were words, faded, nearly illegible, but still hauntingly clear, don't look it in the eyes. The message was crudely carved, as if done in a hurry, with deep grooves where the writer's hand had trembled. I turned back toward the door, suddenly feeling trapped, as if the very walls were leaning in closer, waiting for me to stay. Just as I was about to leave, a sound broke the silence. A low, rumbling growl, like the throat of something ancient and angry, filled the air outside. My pulse quickened, but I told myself it was probably just a bear. I'd encountered plenty of those in my time hiking. But this, this was different. Bears didn't make the air feel charged, like lightning waiting to strike. I backed away from the door, keeping my steps quiet, holding my breath. The growl faded, replaced by heavy footfalls that circled the cabin, slow and deliberate. Whatever it was, it was big, bigger than any bear I'd ever heard. I fumbled for the hunting knife strapped to my belt, its cold, familiar weight barely reassuring. Then I remembered the lantern on the table. I lit it, figuring that even the faintest light might keep whatever was outside from coming closer. As the flame flickered to life, a shadow moved across the window. I could only see part of it, a massive, hulking figure covered in matted fur, with limbs too long and spindly to belong to any animal I knew. It stopped just outside the door, its presence filling the room with an unshakable sense of dread. The minutes passed like hours. I could hear its breath, deep, ragged, almost like a smoker's rasp. Then, something slammed against the door, hard enough to make the wood creak and splinter. I knew, somehow, that whatever it was didn't just want me gone. It wanted me. The scratching started next, slow and methodical, like nails dragging across the wood. I held the knife tighter, watching the door, waiting for it to give. My eyes darted to the message carved into the wall, don't look it in the eyes. Whatever that meant, it seemed to be the only clue I had. Suddenly, the door burst open, and there it was. The creature stood just outside the threshold, its face obscured by shadows, but I could feel its eyes burning into me. 
I forced myself not to look, keeping my gaze fixed on the ground as I backed away, but my curiosity fought against my instinct to survive. It took a single step inside, and I caught the edge of its shape, a mass of fur and bone, twisted and unnatural, like something stitched together from nightmares. Its limbs were jointed wrong, bending at angles that made my skin crawl. I held my breath, praying it would leave, but it only came closer, its footfall shaking the floorboards beneath me. I gripped the knife, my knuckles white. The cabin was too small for me to maneuver, and every instinct I had told me to run, but I didn't dare turn my back. Instead, I crouched low, readying myself for whatever came next. The creature stopped, just inches away, its hot breath washing over me, thick with the scent of rot and damp earth. Then, as if testing me, it reached out a hand, if you could call it that. The fingers were long, each tipped with a jagged claw that looked as though it could slice through bone. I felt my stomach twist, but I forced myself to stay still, to not look up. The creature's claws brushed my arm, lightly, almost tenderly, and then it lunged. I swung the knife, feeling it sink into something solid, but it barely seemed to face the thing. It let out a sound, a horrible, gurgling roar that vibrated through my chest. I pulled the knife out and struck again, this time aiming for what I thought was its head. The blade connected, and I felt a rush of adrenaline as the creature staggered back, but it didn't retreat. If anything, it seemed angrier. Its clawed hand swiped across my chest, tearing through my jacket and slicing into flesh. Pain shot through me, hot and blinding, but I couldn't let it end here. I dropped to the ground, rolling to avoid another strike, and grabbed a broken piece of wood from the floor, using it like a club. I swung with all my strength, and the creature snarled, stumbling just enough for me to scramble to my feet. I knew I couldn't keep this up. I was losing blood, my vision blurring around the edges, but I couldn't let this thing win. With a final burst of strength, I kicked it back, forcing it toward the door. It stumbled, its body hitting the threshold with a sickening crunch. For a split second, I saw its face, if you could call it that, a twisted, hollowed-out mask with empty eye sockets and a moth filled with teeth that didn't seem to fit. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it backed away into the darkness, its form melting into the shadows beyond the door. I didn't wait to see if it would return. I stumbled out of the cabin, my breath ragged, my chest burning with each step. The forest was silent once more, but I could still feel the creature's presence lurking, watching. I staggered down the trail, feeling the weight of its eyes on me the entire way back to civilization. No one believed me when I told them what happened. Not the ranger I stumbled upon near dawn, not the doctors who stitched me up. They said it was a bear attack, maybe a wolf. But I knew the truth, even if no one else did. I hadn't looked it in the eyes, but I'd come close enough to feel the emptiness behind them. My name is Thomas Birch, and I work as a park ranger in the Ozarks. The event I'm about to tell you happened to me on July 16, 1992, while I was deep in the woods for a solo survey of the area's deer population. I've been a ranger for over a decade, but this particular summer stands out like a jagged scar in my memory. It was supposed to be an uneventful week, trekking through one of the more isolated regions of the forest, but what I encountered there left me questioning everything I thought I knew about the wild. I was 34 at the time, no family to speak of except a brother who lived a few states over. Never married, no kids. Being out in the woods had always felt like home to me. The dense thickets, the towering trees, the distant sounds of streams running through the land, it all had a way of quieting my mind. That week in July was no different, at least at first. The sky was clear, the weather warm but tolerable. I was set to camp for five nights, surveying trails that had gone and used for years. The first couple of days were peaceful. I followed the trails, checked the animal tracks, marked areas for future campers. 
It was during my third day out that things began to feel off. I was hiking through a particularly overgrown part of the forest, thick with ferns and old oak trees, when I noticed something strange. The birds, usually so loud in the summer, had gone silent. Not just for a minute or two, but for hours. The woods were unnervingly quiet. I told myself it was just the wind, maybe the heat getting to me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The kind of feeling that makes your skin prickle and your gut tighten up. That evening, I made camp near a small creek, ate a quick meal, and tried to relax by the fire. I didn't feel like calling anyone, mostly because cell service was unreliable out there, but also because I didn't want to sound paranoid. What was I going to say? Hey, Joe, I think the birds aren't on some conspiracy out here. No, I kept it to myself. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange noise. At first, I thought it was just an animal, maybe a deer or a raccoon, but it sounded wrong. There was a rhythmic thudding, like something heavy moving through the brush. I stayed quiet, listening. It moved closer the sound of branches snapping and undergrowth crunching growing louder. I grabbed my flashlight and clicked it on, pointing it toward the sound. Nothing. The light illuminated only trees, rocks, and the creek beside me. The sound stopped. I could have sworn I heard breathing, but that too vanished as quickly as it came. I stayed up the rest of the night, sitting by the fire with my rifle close at hand but nothing else disturbed me. By the time morning came, I was exhausted but determined to finish my survey. It wasn't uncommon for animals to wander close to camp, after all. Still, something about that night kept nagging at me. I packed up and pressed deeper into the forest, knowing I was at least another two days away from my truck. By midday, I found something that made my stomach drop. There, on the trail in front of me, were a series of tracks. I've seen my share of animal prints in the Ozarks, but these were different. They looked like they belonged to a large dog or wolf, but bigger, much bigger. The pads were wide, and the claws left deep marks in the earth. Whatever made them had to be heavy, and it was walking on two legs. That's what made me stop cold. Dogs don't walk on two legs. I took out my camera snapped a few pictures, and continued on, more cautiously now. The air felt thicker, almost oppressive, like something was out there, watching my every move. I tried to shake it off, telling myself it was just my imagination running wild, but my instincts were screaming at me to be on high alert. Later that afternoon, I stumbled across something even more disturbing. The carcass of a deer lay torn open in the middle of a clearing. Its ribs were exposed, flesh ripped apart in jagged strips. I'd seen predators take down deer before, but this, this was brutal. Whatever had killed the deer didn't just do it for food. It looked like it was done out of pure rage. The animal's neck was snapped, its legs twisted at unnatural angles. I crouched down to examine the scene closer when I heard a low rustling behind me. I spun around, rifle in hand but again, nothing. The clearing was empty, save for me and the dead deer. But I knew something was there. I could feel it, that weight in the air, that sense of being hunted. My pulse quickened, and I decided to make camp early, not far from the clearing. I wanted to stay close enough to examine the tracks again in the morning, but far enough away to not be an easy target. I set up my tent against the large rock my back protected, and spent the evening nervously listening to the sounds of the forest, waiting. The night passed slowly, each minute dragging like an eternity. Around midnight, I heard it again, that same rhythmic thudding from the night before. But this time, it was accompanied by something else. A low, guttural sound, almost like a growl, but deeper, more resonant. I grabbed my flashlight and rifle, stepping out of my tent as quietly as I could. The forest was pitch black, my small fire the only light for miles. Then I saw it. A pair of glowing eyes, 
just beyond the tree line, reflecting the firelight. They were too high up to belong to any regular animal. My heart hammered in my chest as I slowly raised the rifle, aiming toward the eyes. The creature didn't move. It just stared, unblinking. For a moment, I thought maybe it was a trick of the light, maybe my exhaustion was playing with my mind. But then it stepped forward. The creature was massive, at least seven feet tall, covered in dark, matted fur. Its arms were long, almost reaching the ground, and its face, its face was a grotesque mix of animal and human features. The snout was elongated like a wolf's, but the eyes, those glowing eyes, held an unnatural intelligence. It let out a low, menacing growl, the sound vibrating through the air and into my bones. I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the forest, but the creature barely flinched. It took another step toward me, bearing sharp, yellow teeth. My hands shook as I chambered another round, but before I could fire again, it lunged. I dove to the side, the creature crashing into my campfire, scattering embers and ash into the air. I scrambled to my feet, heart pounding, adrenaline surging through me as I raised the rifle again. This time, I didn't aim for the body. I aimed for its head. The shot hit its mark. The creature let out a deafening screech, stumbling backward, its hand clutching the side of its skull. Blood, dark and thick, oozed from the wound, but it didn't go down. It staggered, dazed but still very much alive. I took the opportunity to grab my pack and run. I didn't stop to look back, not until I reached the trail that would take me back to my truck. The sun was just beginning to rise when I finally made it to the truck. My clothes were torn, my body aching from the fall and the sprint through the woods. I drove straight to the ranger station, still in shock, trying to make sense of what I had seen. I told my supervisor about the deer carcass, the tracks, the creature. He listened, but I could tell by the look in his eyes that he didn't believe me. Later that week, I went back to the clearing with a few other rangers, but the deer carcass was gone. The tracks had been washed away by rain. There was no physical evidence of what had happened. Just my word, and the faint scar on my arm from where the creature's claw had grazed me as I fled. I never went back to that part of the forest again. I later learned the locals had a name for it, the Ozark Howler. A creature of legend, a tale passed down through generations. But I know better. I know it's not just a story. It's real. And it's still out there. My name is Walter Finch, and this happened to me on August 3, 1986, in the thick, uncharted forests of central Pennsylvania. I'd been a hiker all my life, and every summer, I set out for one major trek to clear my head, test my limits, and feel the hum of untouched nature around me. This trip, I was aiming to complete a loop around some of the more remote trails in the Allegheny National Forest, an area known for its thick foliage and challenging terrain. Most folks didn't venture out that far, but I'd always found comfort in solitude, away from the sounds and sights of everyday life. I was in my late thirties back then, recently divorced, and honestly, I needed this more than ever. Hiking was more than a pastime, it was a way for me to reconnect with myself. There's something about the way the world quiets in the woods, about the scent of pine and earth mingling in the air, that just gets to the core view. But I wasn't naive. I knew the dangers of hiking alone, especially in these old woods where cell signals didn't reach and rescue services could take hours, if not days, to find you. I had my compass, a reliable map, a flask of whiskey, and enough supplies to last me the week. I'd planned meticulously, as always, because out there, you can't afford mistakes. The first few days were peaceful. The trails were dense with towering trees that blocked out most of the sunlight, leaving only streams of light flickering through the leaves. At night, the air would cool down, almost chilling, and the woods seemed to come alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures. 
the isolation was exactly what I needed, until I reached an area I hadn't planned on, a place that wasn't on my map. On the third night, I set up camp by a stream and noticed an odd path leading away from the trail I'd been following. The map didn't mark it, and there weren't any signs that it was a trail, but it had that unmistakable look of a man-made route, worn down over years. My curiosity got the better of me. Maybe it was an old logging path, I thought, or a shortcut hunters used. Against my better judgment, I decided I'd explore it in the morning, just a quick detour before heading back to the main trail. Morning came with a dense fog that clung to the ground, making everything feel surreal and otherworldly. I packed up camp and started down the path, stepping carefully as the fog gave the forest an unsettling silence. I'd gone maybe half a mile in when I noticed something strange. The forest here was too quiet. No birds, no rustling of small animals, nothing but the faint crackle of leaves underfoot. The trees seemed older, their trunks twisted and thick with age, moss clinging to them like they were trying to hide something. It felt as if I was trespassing, as if this part of the forest hadn't been touched by human hands in decades, maybe centuries. After another half mile, I found the cabin. It was ancient, half sunken into the ground, with moss covering the roof and walls. The door was slightly ajar, creaking gently in the breeze that barely reached this far into the woods. I approached cautiously, drawn by a mixture of curiosity and something I couldn't quite name, a sense of wrongness, perhaps. The place was clearly abandoned, but there was an air about it, a heaviness as if the cabin itself was watching me. Against my better judgment, I pushed open the door and stepped inside. The air was thick and stale, filled with the scent of rotting wood and something else, something sharp and metallic. The interior was sparse, just a broken table and a few chairs, but what caught my attention was the wall at the back. There were markings carved into the wood, symbols I didn't recognize, circles with intersecting lines and odd shapes that seemed to dance if you stared at them too long. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I couldn't look away. And that's when I heard it. A low, rhythmic sound, almost like chanting, coming from somewhere deep in the woods. It was faint, barely audible over the silence, but unmistakable. I turned to leave, a sense of dread growing in my gut but as I stepped out, I noticed something at the edge of the clearing, a figure, standing unnaturally still between the trees. I couldn't make out any details. It was tall, gaunt, with limbs that seemed too long for its body, and it wore what looked like animal skins, draped over its shoulders like some kind of primitive cloak. Its face was hidden in shadow, but I could feel its eyes on me, cold and calculating. I froze heart pounding as I tried to rationalize what I was seeing. A hunter, maybe, or someone else who'd taken a wrong turn out here. But then it moved. It took a step forward, slow and deliberate, and I realized it was holding something, a spear, carved from a thick branch with a sharp, jagged stone tied to the end. The chanting grew louder, as if coming from all around me, and I felt panic surge through my veins. I didn't think. I just ran. I sprinted back down the path, lungs burning, legs aching, but the sounds were getting closer. I could hear the crack of branches and the soft thud of footsteps not far behind. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of it, but nothing added up. The figure, the chanting, the ancient symbols, it felt like I'd stumbled into some forgotten ritual, something that didn't belong in this world. I burst back onto the main trail and didn't stop running until my legs gave out. I collapsed by a tree, gasping for breath, my body shaking with exhaustion and fear. I waited, straining to hear any sign of pursuit, but there was only silence. Minutes passed, then an hour, and eventually, I convinced myself that I'd escaped. I knew I couldn't stay there, though. I had to get back to civilization, to tell someone to make sense of what had happened. But as I stood up, I noticed something on the ground in front of me, footprints. They were large, barefoot, and led back down the trail, deeper into the forest. 
the footprints stretched off into the trees, large and distinct, pressing deep into the damp soil. Each step was spaced wider than I could ever reach, almost unnatural in its length. For a moment, I just stood there, frozen, my heart pounding in my ears as I tried to wrap my head around what I was seeing. There was no way those could belong to a human, not with that kind of stride. I turned in the opposite direction, forcing my legs to move, half stumbling as I broke into a run. My only thought was to put as much distance between me and whatever had left those prints. The path seemed longer now, twisting in unfamiliar ways, as though the forest itself had shifted to trap me. The trees loomed closer, branches clawing at me as I pushed through. Finally, I broke through the tree line and saw the road, gravel and dirt stretching in both directions, a faint sign of civilization. I staggered toward it, barely aware of my surroundings, until the headlights of a passing truck caught me off guard. I waved it down frantically, my hand shaking as the truck pulled over. The driver, an older man with a weary expression, watched me climb into the cab. You look like you've seen a ghost, he said, his voice rough but kind. I didn't respond, just nodded, trying to catch my breath, still feeling the weight of eyes watching me from the woods. As we pulled away, I glanced back one last time at the dark line of trees, half expecting to see that figure standing there. But there was nothing, only the endless stretch of forest disappearing into the night. The driver didn't ask any more questions, and I didn't offer any answers. I'm Marshall Lane, and I used to lead hiking tours up in the Ozarks. This happened to me on October 7, 1986, during one of those trips I had done dozens of times before, but it was the last time I ever set foot on that mountain. I've been hiking these trails since I was a kid growing up not far from the Arkansas border, and there's something special about the place. The quiet, the sheer rugged beauty of the mountains, none of it ever gets old. I've been leading folks through these parts for years, from weekenders looking for a little adventure to seasoned outdoorsmen seeking something more. That fall, I had a small group, a couple from St. Louis, Dean and Tammy Warren, and another guy named Luke Ridley, a loner from Kansas City. The plan was simple, a three-day trek to a remote peak, camp for a night, and hike back. The weather was perfect for it, crisp and clear, with the leaves just starting to turn. The trail was familiar to me, and I knew we'd have no trouble reaching the campsite before dusk. Dean and Tammy were the chatty types, constantly peppering me with questions about the local wildlife, the terrain, and the history of the area. Luke, on the other hand, kept mostly to himself, staying a few paces behind us, lost in his own world. I'd see him glancing up at the cliffs now and then, but he didn't say much. I figured he just needed some space. By the time we reached the base of the mountain where we'd set up camp, the sun was hanging low in the sky, casting long shadows across the forest floor. I showed them how to pitch their tents and got a fire going while Tammy unpacked some snacks and Dean fumbled with the camera he'd brought. Luke, still quiet, was sitting on a rock, staring out into the woods. You all right, Luke? I asked, tossing a couple more logs onto the fire. He didn't answer at first. Then, without looking at me, he said, there's something out there. I laughed. Out there? Like what? A bear? Maybe a coyote? He shook his head, his face pale. No. I don't know what it is, but I've been feeling it all day. Watching us. Dean laughed. Come on, man, it's the Ozarks. Probably a deer or something. Luke's eyes darted to the tree line, just beyond the fire's glow. It's not a deer. I glanced into the woods, too, more out of habit than concern. I'd been out here enough to know that people unfamiliar with the wilderness tend to get spooked by every little sound or shadow. But Luke's unease was contagious. His hand rested on the handle of the hunting knife strapped to his belt, and I noticed his breathing was shallow, like he was waiting for something to happen. 
I didn't like the look in his eyes. All right, I said, standing up and dusting off my pants, how about we get some rest? It's gonna be a long day tomorrow, and we'll need the energy. Dean groaned. Rest? I was just getting into the camping spirit. Tammy nudged him. Come on, let's not be difficult. Luke was already in his tent, and I followed suit, though my mind kept replaying what he'd said. I told myself it was nothing. Maybe he was just spooked by the isolation, the dark. But something about his voice, the way it trembled, stuck with me. The wind picked up as the night deepened, rustling through the trees like whispers. I lay there in my tent, staring at the thin fabric separating me from the wilderness, listening to the sounds of the forest. It should have been peaceful, but it wasn't. There was an edge to the night, like something was out there, lurking, waiting. I must have dozed off at some point because the next thing I knew, I was jolted awake by a scream. I scrambled out of my sleeping bag, heart pounding, and unzipped the tent. Luke was standing by the fire, his face pale as a ghost. Dean and Tammy were already out of their tent, looking around frantically. Luke, what the hell? Dean asked, rubbing his eyes. Luke pointed into the woods, his voice barely a whisper. It's out there, I saw it. I followed his gaze, squinting into the darkness. Saw what? He didn't answer. Instead, he started walking toward the trees, knife drawn. Luke, wait! I called, grabbing my flashlight and following him. Dean and Tammy trailed behind, clearly confused but too freaked out to stay behind. We followed Luke deeper into the woods, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The further we went, the more I started to feel it, too, a presence. Like the forest was alive, watching us, waiting. My pulse quickened, and I had to fight the urge to turn back. Something wasn't right. We reached a small clearing, and that's when I saw it. At first, I thought it was a bear. But no bear I'd ever seen stood on two legs like that, its eyes glowing faintly in the light. It was tall, impossibly tall, with matted fur hanging from its limbs like moss. Its face was wrong, too long, too sharp. And its eyes, those damn eyes, were the worst part. They weren't the eyes of an animal. They were intelligent. Hungry. For a moment, none of us moved. We were frozen, staring at the thing as it stared back. Then, without warning, it let out a sound, a low, rumbling growl that seemed to vibrate in my chest. Luke lunged at it, knife raised, but the thing swatted him aside like he weighed nothing. He flew back, hitting the ground hard. Run! I shouted, shoving Dean and Tammy toward the trees. We bolted, crashing through the underbrush, my heart hammering in my chest. I could hear the thing behind us, its heavy footfalls shaking the earth. I didn't dare look back. All I could think about was getting away putting as much distance between us and it as possible. We reached a ridge, and I skidded to a halt, grabbing Dean by the arm to stop him from running over the edge. Below us was a steep drop, jagged rocks waiting at the bottom. We were trapped. Tammy was gasping for breath, her eyes wide with terror. What do we do? I scanned the area, trying to think. My flashlight flickered, and for a moment, the beam caught something in the distance, a cave, hidden in the rocks. Over there. I pointed. We can hide in that cave. We sprinted toward it, the thing still behind us, getting closer with every step. The mouth of the cave loomed in front of us like a black hole, and we dove inside just as the thing crashed through the trees, snarling. We huddled in the darkness, trying to catch our breath listening to the thing pacing outside. I could hear its claws scraping against the rocks, its breath rasping like it was sniffing us out. Marshall. Tammy whispered, her voice trembling. What was that? I don't know, I admitted, my hands shaking. But we can't stay here. 
It'll find us eventually. Dean peeked out from behind a rock, his face pale. It's circling the cave. We're trapped. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew he was right. We couldn't outrun it, and we couldn't fight it. Not without something more than a knife and a flashlight. And then I remembered something. The flare gun. I always carried one in case of emergencies, tucked away in my pack. Stay here, I said, crawling toward the mouth of the cave. The thing was pacing back and forth, its silhouette barely visible against the night sky. I reached into my pack, fingers fumbling as I pulled out the flare gun. My hands were slick with sweat, and for a moment, I wasn't sure I could do it. But then I thought of Luke, lying out there somewhere, and I knew I had to. I took aim and fired. The flare shot into the air with a blinding flash, illuminating the creature in all its grotesque glory. For a split second, I saw it clearly, the long, matted fur, the twisted, animalistic features, the eyes burning with malice. And then it was gone, disappearing into the trees with a shriek that echoed through the mountains. We waited in silence, hearts pounding, but it didn't return. We were alive. By the time we made it back to camp, the sun was rising, casting a pale light over the clearing. There was no sign of Luke. His knife was still there, stuck in the dirt where he dropped it, but he was gone. I never found out what happened to him. The rangers searched for days, but came up empty. They said he must have wandered off, gotten lost in the woods. But I knew better. That thing, it took him. I never went back to those mountains after that. My name is Dean Phelps, and this happened to me on October 16, 1995, somewhere in the Ozark Mountains, just outside a small town called Calhoun. I was out there to do what I usually did when life in town got a little too loud, hike, camp, lose myself in the peace of the wilderness for a few days. I had a job I liked well enough back in town, working at a local hardware store, and I lived alone, which suited me fine. I wasn't the type who needed much more than a good book and a quiet evening to unwind. But every now and then, the itch to head out into the hills would grab me, and I'd set off for a couple of days with nothing but a tent, some rations, and a whole lot of solitude. That week in October, things were getting tense at the store. People were coming in and out, stocking up for the winter, making requests, getting edgy as the days shortened and the air got colder. The mountains were starting to feel like a call, loud and clear, so I packed up and headed out early Monday morning. The weather was mild enough, chilly but not yet biting, and the trees were losing their leaves in a riot of reds and yellows. I knew these trails well, but this time, I was taking a route I'd only ever scouted before, something a little deeper in the woods. After about three hours of hiking, I settled at a spot beside a narrow creek surrounded by thick oaks and a scattering of pines. The place felt remote, untouched, just what I was after. There was a distinct kind of silence out there, the kind that only comes when you're miles from the nearest town. It suited me. I pitched my tent, got a fire going, and settled in for the night with the sounds of the forest as my only company. The first night passed without a hitch. I woke up feeling refreshed, stretched out in the cool morning air, and decided to explore a bit further up the creek. I'd read about the area, folks mentioned strange things now and again, but I never paid much mind to local tales. There were always stories about creatures and spirits in the woods, but I'd been out here enough times to know that, most of the time, those stories came from people looking to scare themselves for fun. Besides, I was as cautious as they came, no risky cliffs, no wild animals. I'd seen my fair share of black bears and a few cougars in my time, but they always kept their distance. That second day, though, something felt different. As I made my way up the creek, I noticed how quiet it was. The usual birdsong was gone, and even the wind felt strange, like it was holding its breath. The sense of solitude I usually found comforting now felt heavy, pressing in on me. 
I brushed it off, chalking it up to the unsettling stillness of fall, but as I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Around noon, I found a peculiar clearing. It was a bare patch, surrounded by rocks arranged in an odd, almost deliberate circle. I'd never seen anything like it, and it gave me pause. The rocks weren't natural, they looked like they'd been moved there intentionally, though they were covered in moss and leaves. I examined them, curious, but there was nothing obvious about their purpose. Just rocks in a ring, sitting in the middle of nowhere. The more I looked, the stranger I felt. It was like the forest itself was watching, like every rustle of leaves was a whispered warning. A chill ran down my back, and I felt a sudden urge to turn back, to leave that place behind. But something else kept me there, some mix of curiosity and stubbornness. I walked a few paces into the clearing, my boots crunching on the dried leaves, and crouched down to examine one of the rocks. That's when I heard it, a low, distant sound. Not an animal, not the wind. It was like a voice, a murmur that didn't belong. I stood up fast, scanning the trees, but there was no one there. The air felt thick, like I was breathing in something that wasn't meant to be touched. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to go back, but I found myself rooted to the spot, straining to make sense of the strange whispering that drifted through the trees. The voice grew louder, more insistent, and I finally turned, taking a step back toward the creek. As I did, I saw movement at the edge of the clearing. Something shifted in the shadows, a shape that didn't make sense. It was tall, lean, and just beyond clear sight. I froze, watching it. It stood there, silent, as if it was waiting for me to move. I felt my heart pounding, adrenaline hitting me hard as I backed away slowly, my eyes locked on the thing in the shadows. I didn't know what I was looking at but I knew it wasn't an animal. It was too tall, its limbs too long, and it had an unnatural stillness that set every nerve in my body on edge. The stories I'd brushed off started flooding back, tales of creatures, spirits, things that walked the mountains when nobody was looking. With every slow step I took, it took one, two. It mirrored my movement, almost playfully as if it was enjoying the slow dread that built up inside me. I wanted to run, but something told me that running would only make it worse. So I kept my pace steady, my eyes fixed on the thing as I moved toward the safety of the creek. As I neared the edge of the clearing, it stopped, tilting its head like it was studying me. And then, without warning, it took a step forward, closing the distance between us in an instant. I stumbled back my foot catching on a rock, and I fell hard, landing in the cold mud beside the creek. I scrambled to get up, my hands slipping on the wet ground, but it was there, looming over me, its dark form blocking out the faint light filtering through the trees. I grabbed a fallen branch, holding it up in a poor excuse for a weapon, and for a moment, it hesitated, almost as if it recognized the defiance in my stance. It shifted, bending down bringing its face closer to mine, and I finally saw it clearly, hollow eyes that seemed to absorb the light, a mouth stretched into something that wasn't quite a grin but felt like one. It was something out of a nightmare, a face that didn't belong to any creature I knew, something ancient and wrong. I swung the branch at it, a desperate move, but it barely flinched, its dark, thin arms snapping out to grab it mid-swing. It crushed the branch with ease its long fingers wrapping around it like it was nothing. I was out of options, out of breath, and panic took over. I reached for my pack, where I kept a small hunting knife, hoping that maybe it would be enough, but as my fingers closed around the handle, the creature lunged, its other hand reaching for me. With a surge of adrenaline, I managed to pull the knife free and slash at its arm. The blade bit into its skin, if it even had skin, and I felt a brief resistance before it let go, retreating a step with a low, hissing sound. For the first time, it seemed caught off guard, like it hadn't expected me to fight back. Taking advantage of its hesitation, I stumbled to my feet, gripping the knife tightly, my hand shaking. 
The creature recovered quickly, though, and its eyes narrowed, a hint of malice seeping into its hollow gaze. It circled me, its movements slow and deliberate, like it was toying with me, testing my limits. We moved like that for what felt like hours, a deadly dance of predator and prey. I slashed at it whenever it got too close, keeping it at bay, but I knew I couldn't keep it up forever. My arms were tiring, my legs shaking from the constant movement, and the creature sensed it. It closed in, faster, its movements becoming more aggressive, more confident. Finally, it lunged again, and I barely had time to react. I threw myself to the side, the creature missing me by inches. I hit the ground hard, the wind knocked out of me, but I didn't let go of the knife. The creature turned, advancing, and I knew I only had one chance. With every ounce of strength left in me, I aimed the knife at its chest, bracing myself as it charged. The blade connected, sinking deep, and the creature let out a sound that chilled me to my core. It staggered, its hollow eyes widening, and for a moment, it looked almost human, vulnerable, confused. Then it collapsed, a heap of twisted limbs and unnatural stillness. I didn't wait to see if it would get back up. I grabbed my pack and ran, not stopping until I was miles away, the weight of the encounter pressing down on me with every step. I'm Samuel Donner, and I'm a wildlife researcher. This happened to me on July 15, 1984, during one of my solo hikes in the Chugash Mountains of Alaska. I'd always preferred the solitude out here, just me in the wilderness. There's something humbling about being in a place where nature reigns supreme, where every decision you make is a matter of life or death. For the past few years, I'd been studying the migration patterns of doll sheep and this particular trip was meant to be just a routine check on some collared individuals I'd been tracking. I was supposed to be out for three days, nothing too extreme. I had a tent, provisions, and a rifle. A lot of people might think carrying a rifle into the wilderness is unnecessary, but when you've got bears, wolves, and the occasional moose, you can't afford to take chances. My colleagues back at the university joked that I was paranoid. Maybe I was, but I'd rather be cautious than become a statistic. The first day was uneventful. I found a good spot to set up camp, not too far from a stream where I could refill my water supply. It was quiet out there, the only sound being the occasional call of a distant bird or the rustling of leaves in the wind. I spent most of that day following tracks noting down movements on my map, and enjoying the peace that came with the isolation. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, I made my way back to camp, cooked some instant noodles, and settled into my tent for the night. Day two started off like any other. I woke up to a chill in the air, the kind that gets into your bones and reminds you just how far you are from civilization. I packed up camp and continued my trek following a ridge that offered a panoramic view of the valley below. That's when I noticed something strange. There was a group of doll sheep on a nearby slope, but they weren't behaving like they usually did. Instead of grazing or moving in their typical, slow manner, they were all huddled together, facing the same direction as if they were watching something. Curiosity got the better of me, and I pulled out my binoculars. I scanned the area they were fixated on but didn't see anything out of the ordinary, just rocks and snow. But the sheep wouldn't budge. It struck me as odd, but I shrugged it off, thinking maybe a predator was nearby. Perhaps a wolf had passed through earlier. Still, I made a note of it in my journal and continued on my way. By late afternoon, I started to feel uneasy. The weather was fine and I hadn't seen any dangerous animals, but something was off. I couldn't put my finger on it, but the usual sense of calm I had during my hikes wasn't there. I was hyper-aware of every sound, the crunch of my boots on the gravel, the rustle of leaves in the distance, the occasional snapping of a twig. I chalked it up to being alone for too long. Isolation can do weird things to your mind, make you jumpy when there's no reason to be. 
I set up camp again near a small grove of trees. The spot wasn't perfect, but it offered some cover from the wind that had picked up. As dusk approached, I couldn't shake the feeling that something, or someone, was watching me. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see an animal or maybe another hiker, but there was nothing. Just the emptiness of the mountains. It was unsettling, to say the least. That night, as I lay in my tent, I heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps outside. At first, I thought it was a bear or maybe a curious fox, but the pattern of the steps was deliberate, heavy. It wasn't the random rustling of an animal. I held my breath, listening. The footsteps circled my tent once, twice, and then stopped. My hand instinctively reached for the rifle beside me. Who's there? I called out, trying to sound calm, though my heart was pounding in my chest. There was no response, only silence. I waited, the air in the tent thick with tension, but after what felt like an eternity, the footsteps resumed, this time moving away from my camp. I lay there, wide-eyed, gripping my rifle until the first light of dawn crept through the tent. The next morning, I found tracks, human tracks, leading away from my tent down the slope toward the valley. They weren't mine. Whoever, or whatever, had been there was barefoot. I was miles from the nearest road, and there was no sign of any other campers or hikers in the area. My gut told me to pack up and leave, but I still had one more day out here. Against my better judgment, I decided to stay and finish what I came for. I tried to focus on my research but my mind kept wandering back to the tracks. Who in their right mind would be wandering the Alaskan wilderness barefoot? The more I thought about it, the less sense it made. Maybe it was a local, someone who lived off the grid. But even then, why come to my camp in the middle of the night? By late afternoon, I was on edge again. Every sound made me jump. I kept scanning the area with my binoculars, half expecting to see someone lurking behind the trees. That's when I saw it, movement in the distance. It was quick, almost too quick to catch. At first, I thought it was a bear, but when I focused the binoculars, I saw a figure darting between the trees. It was tall, gaunt, and moved in a way that didn't seem natural, almost like it was gliding instead of walking. I stood there, frozen. My brain couldn't process what I was seeing. It didn't look human, but it wasn't an animal either. It was something else, something I couldn't explain. I lowered the binoculars and blinked, hoping my eyes were playing tricks on me. But when I looked again, the figure was still there, watching me from the tree line. I grabbed my rifle, heart racing, and started backing away toward camp. The figure didn't move, just stood there, staring. I couldn't make out any features, just its silhouette against the trees. Then, without warning, it let out a sound. It wasn't a growl or a roar, but something in between, a low, guttural noise that made my skin crawl. I raised the rifle, my hands shaking, and fired a warning shot into the air. The figure didn't flinch. It didn't move. It just kept watching. I didn't wait for it to get any closer. I grabbed my gear and took off, running faster than I ever had in my life. My lungs burned, my legs ached, but I didn't stop. I didn't look back. I knew if I did, I might see it again, and I couldn't handle that. I just ran. By the time I reached the main trail, the sun was beginning to set. I kept moving, not daring to stop until I reached my truck parked at the trailhead. I threw my gear into the back jumped in, and sped off, not caring about the dust cloud I left behind. I never reported what I saw. Who would believe me? I barely believed it myself. But I know what I saw that day, and it wasn't something from this world. It was something else, something that shouldn't exist. I haven't been back to the Chugash Mountains since. As for what that thing was? I don't know. Maybe it was some kind of cryptid, a creature from legend that people dismiss as myth. 
Or maybe it was something worse, something that even the old stories don't mention. All I know is that it's still out there, somewhere in those mountains, watching, waiting. My name is Thad Merrill, and this happened to me on October 14, 1989, in the Ozark Mountains of northern Arkansas. I was alone on a weekend hike, something I'd done dozens of times before. My work as a surveyor kept me in offices more than I liked, and any chance I got to break away into the mountains, I took it. I guess you could say I found a peace out there, a sense of belonging that only came when it was just me, the trees and the sound of wind in the pines. Nothing quite matches the quiet hum of nature. That weekend, I'd chosen an area I'd only explored once or twice. The trail wound through dense forest, with little sunlight piercing through the thick canopy of oak and hickory. I didn't see another soul on the way up, which suited me fine. I'd packed enough supplies for a couple of nights and had my trusty old .22 rifle slung across my back. It was mostly for small game, but it was reliable and comforting to carry. By late afternoon, the sky had turned a strange shade of gray, thick clouds rolling in over the mountains like a tide. I set up camp near a clearing where I'd have a view of the valley below. The spot was perfect. Trees circled the clearing like silent sentinels, and I felt that familiar sense of solitude. But as night fell, a peculiar unease settled over me something I couldn't shake. It was the kind of feeling that gnaws at you, even if you can't quite pinpoint the source. Around midnight, I heard the first sound, something distant, almost like a howl. It echoed faintly through the trees, so faint that I questioned whether I'd heard it at all. The sound came again, low and drawn out, cutting through the silence. I sat up, straining to listen, every nerve in my body alert. The forest was still, but something about that sound felt wrong. Too deep. Too hollow. And it wasn't anything I'd heard before. I told myself it was just an animal, maybe a coyote, and tried to sleep. But an hour later, I heard it again, closer this time. I sat up, gripping my rifle, and scanned the darkness beyond my small circle of firelight. I could make out shadows in the trees. Shapes that seemed to shift and blur with every flicker of the flames. But there was nothing there, at least nothing I could see. The night dragged on, each hour stretching longer than the last. That strange howl sounded at intervals, sometimes distant, sometimes alarmingly close, but each time it felt closer, creeping in on me. I barely slept, and by dawn, my nerves were shot. I'd been out in the wilderness enough to know that fear can play tricks on the mind, but this felt different, like something was watching, waiting. The next day, I decided to cut my trip short. As much as I hated to admit it, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being stalked. I packed up my gear, slung my rifle over my shoulder, and started back down the trail. The sun was out, but even in the daylight, the forest felt wrong. I was careful, glancing over my shoulder more than I'd care to admit. Every rustle in the underbrush made me jump, every snap of a twig sent a jolt of adrenaline through me. About halfway down the trail, I noticed something odd. Tracks large, deep prints in the dirt, like a massive animal had passed through. They were wider than any bear track I'd ever seen, with long, claw-like impressions at the toes. I knelt down, studying them, my mind racing. Whatever made those tracks was big, heavy, and nearby. I followed the tracks cautiously, my rifle at the ready. They led me off the trail, winding through the trees and over rocky outcrops. The prints grew fresher as I went, the ground disturbed and scraped as if the creature had been dragging something heavy. The air grew thick with a strange, musty scent a mix of wet earth and decay that clung to my nostrils and made my stomach churn. I don't know why I kept going. Maybe it was curiosity, maybe it was some kind of primal instinct. But part of me wanted to see whatever had made those tracks, to understand what had been haunting me through the night. I came to a small clearing, and that's when I saw it. 
the creature was hunched over something in the grass, its back to me. Its body was massive, easily seven feet tall, with dark, matted fur and long limbs that seemed to bend at odd angles. Its hands, or what passed for hands, were clawed, gripping what looked like a deer carcass. The smell hit me like a punch, a sickening stench of rot and blood that made my stomach lurch. I froze, barely breathing, praying that it wouldn't turn around. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. This wasn't a bear, or any animal I knew. It looked like something out of a nightmare, something primal and wrong. Then, as if sensing my presence, the creature lifted its head. Slowly, it turned, and I saw its face, or at least the thing that passed for one. It had sunken eyes that glowed with an unnatural yellow light, a mouth lined with jagged teeth that seemed too large for its head. Its gaze locked onto mine, and a cold dread washed over me, the kind that burrows deep and refuses to let go. In that moment, I realized I wasn't dealing with a simple predator. This was something else, something that didn't belong in the natural order. It let out a guttural snarl, a sound that vibrated through my bones, and rose to its full height, towering over me. Without thinking, I raised my rifle and fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the trees, but the creature barely flinched. It stared at me with those glowing eyes, almost as if it was amused. I fired again, this time aiming for its head, but the bullet seemed to pass through it as if it was nothing more than smoke. Panic surged through me, and I backed away, my mind racing for a plan. The creature took a step toward me, slow and deliberate, its movements unnaturally smooth. I stumbled back, tripping over a root, my rifle slipping from my grasp. I scrambled to my feet, grabbing a branch to steady myself, and swung it at the creature with all the force I could muster. The branch shattered against its side, splinters flying, but it didn't even blink. Realizing I was outmatched, I did the only thing I could think of, I ran. Branches whipped against my face as I tore through the trees, my lungs burning, every instinct screaming at me to keep moving. I could hear it behind me, its footsteps heavy and relentless, like a predator toying with its prey. I don't know how long I ran, but eventually, the trees thinned, and I burst out onto a dirt road, barely able to catch my breath. I glanced back, expecting to see it emerge from the shadows, but the forest was still. Silent. For a moment, I thought I'd escaped. But as I doubled over, catching my breath, that sense of dread washed over me again. It wasn't over. The creature was still out there, lurking in the tree line, hidden by the thick shadows, and I could almost feel its eyes on me, watching, waiting. I knew I couldn't keep running. The thing would track me down, wear me out. I'd need to stand my ground if I wanted any hope of survival. My hands fumbled for my rifle, and I checked the chamber. Two rounds left. I could only hope they'd be enough. Stealing myself, I looked around for anything I could use. Just off the road, there was an old, rusted logging truck abandoned years ago, its metal frame poking out from the underbrush. The bed of the truck held chains, hooks, and a couple of oil drums, and it gave me an idea. I climbed into the truck's cab, rummaging through the glove compartment until I found a battered old lighter. Just as I stepped out, the creature emerged from the woods, creeping into the faint light. It moved slowly, almost lazily, as if savoring the hunt. Its eyes fixed on me, and I could feel its malice, thick and unrelenting. This wasn't just an animal, it was a predator that thrived on fear, and it was determined to make me its next kill. I backed toward the oil drums, forcing myself to stay calm. The drums were old, maybe even empty, but they had enough sludge at the bottom to do the trick. I pulled the lid off one and dipped a rag from my pack into the dark, thick liquid. Keeping my eyes on the creature, I twisted the rag around the hook of an old chain. The creature lunged forward, its claws flashing in the dim light, and I swung the chain, lighting the rag just as it closed the distance. 
The makeshift torch burst into flames, the fire catching the creature's attention. It hesitated, its eyes narrowing, a growl rumbling from its throat. I swung the flaming chain toward it, forcing it back a step. The fire flickered and cast strange shadows across its face, and for the first time, I saw a hint of something in its eyes, hesitation, maybe even fear. Emboldened, I swung again, the flames dancing as they lit up the space between us. The creature snarled, retreating into the shadows, but I pressed forward, not giving it the chance to regroup. My heart pounded, every muscle in my body tense, but I refused to let up. I couldn't give it an inch. Just then, it lunged again, faster and more aggressive this time, its claws slashing through the air. I sidestepped, narrowly avoiding its strike, and swung the torch at its face. The flames licked at its fur, and it let out a screech that was half howl, half scream. It recoiled, swiping at its own face as the fire spread across its fur, its eyes filled with a furious, animalistic rage. Seizing the moment, I grabbed my rifle, took a steadying breath, and aimed. This time, I didn't go for the head. I aimed lower, right at its chest, and pulled the trigger. The shot echoed through the clearing, and the creature staggered back, clutching at the wound, black blood oozing from between its claws. It fell to its knees, its gaze still fixed on me, but the fire was spreading, consuming its matted fur and crackling across its limbs. I watched as it writhed, its body buckling under the flames. It let out one last, terrible scream, a sound that seemed to shake the very ground beneath me. And then, with one final, shuddering breath, it collapsed, the flames engulfing it completely. I stood there, watching the fire burn, the smoke curling into the night sky. I didn't dare move until the creature was nothing more than a charred, smoldering heap on the ground, its monstrous form reduced to ash. Only then did I finally lower the rifle, my hands shaking, my heart racing. The forest was silent again, the eerie quiet settling around me like a blanket. I turned and walked back toward the road, leaving the creature's remains behind, the smell of smoke and char still thick in the air. I didn't look back. I'm Malcolm Shaw, and I used to work as a wildlife researcher out of North Carolina. This happened to me on June 18, 1987, just before I moved to a new project in the Pacific Northwest. I was on my last assignment, hiking deep into Pisgah National Forest to track elk migration patterns for a final report. I had no idea that hike would be anything but routine until I met him. At the time, I was 35 single, and deeply invested in my career. My life was mostly on the road, from one research site to another, and I liked it that way. It gave me a sense of freedom. I wasn't tied down, no family commitments. My parents had passed early, and I never felt the pull to settle down. It was just me, the wild, and the animals I studied. That morning, I parked my truck off an old forest service road packed my gear, and set off into the trees. The sky was overcast, casting the forest in a muted gray light, and the air was thick with humidity. I hiked for hours, my GPS unit keeping track of my location as I went deeper into the forest. The forest felt, still, quieter than usual. The typical sounds of birds and rustling leaves seemed muffled, almost like the forest itself was holding its breath. Around midday, I reached a small clearing near a creek where I planned to set up a trail camera. As I worked, something felt off, a creeping unease that I couldn't quite place. I chalked it up to being alone in the wilderness, sometimes your mind plays tricks on you when you're miles away from anyone. I pushed the feeling aside and started heading west, deeper into the woods. My route would take me through a dense section of forest known for its maze-like network of deer trails. The deeper I went, the more oppressive the quiet became. My radio, which usually picked up the local ranger station, was giving nothing but static. Then, I saw it. At first, it was just a shape, 
a man standing in the distance, partially obscured by trees. He was maybe a hundred yards off the trail, just standing there. It was odd. No one should have been out there. The area I was in wasn't part of any marked trails or campsites. I stopped in my tracks, watching him. He didn't move. I considered calling out, but something about the way he stood, too still, too rigid, kept me silent. I adjusted my pack and continued along the trail, trying to ignore the unease crawling up my spine. But when I glanced back, the man was gone. The forest swallowed him whole without a sound. I picked up my pace, focusing on the task at hand. My plan was to reach the ridge before dusk, then loop back to my truck by nightfall. But the further I went, the more that strange, oppressive feeling returned. I felt watched. Every time I stopped to listen, the forest gave me nothing, no wind, no birds, no movement. Then, about two miles from the ridge, I saw something that made my stomach twist into knots. Hanging from the branch of a low pine tree was a deer carcass. Its throat had been slashed open, and its body was strung up like a macabre trophy. There were no wolves in the area, and the cut was too clean for any animal. It had to be human. I scanned the area, adrenaline pumping through my veins. My first thought was poachers but this felt too deliberate, too personal. I backed away slowly, my eyes darting from tree to tree, trying to catch any movement. The forest was still, eerily so. I debated turning back right then, but something stubborn in me pressed on. I wasn't about to let fear drive me off my assignment. I told myself it was probably some idiot hunter trying to send a message, though who that message was for, I didn't know. As I moved further along the trail, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. I heard footsteps, soft, deliberate, matching my own pace. I stopped. They stopped. I walked faster. They matched me. I was. Being followed. The sun was dipping low now, casting long shadows through the trees. I knew I was in trouble. I turned off the trail and started cutting through the forest, trying to throw off whoever was following me. My heart pounded in my chest, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. After what felt like an eternity, I reached the ridge. But my relief was short-lived. As I crested the hill, I saw a man standing at the edge of the clearing. It was the same man from earlier, tall, thin, his face hidden in the shadow of his wide-brimmed hat. He hadn't moved since I'd first seen him. He was just, waiting. I drew my hunting knife, keeping it low by my side. What do you want? I called out, my voice steady despite the terror gnawing at me. The man didn't answer. He just stood there, his head tilted slightly, like he was studying me. I took a step forward, gripping the knife tighter. Look, I don't want any trouble. I'm just passing through. Still nothing. He didn't even flinch. I considered turning and running, but something told me he'd catch me before I made it far. The tension between us was unbearable, like a string pulled too tight, ready to snap. Then, without warning, he lunged. I barely had time to react. He moved faster than any person should have been able to, closing the distance in an instant. I slashed out with the knife, catching him across the arm. He didn't make a sound, didn't even react to the pain. His other hand shot out, grabbing me by the throat and slamming me into the ground. My vision blurred, the world spinning as I gasped for air. I kicked out, landing a blow to his knee. He grunted, his grip loosening just enough for me to slip free. I scrambled to my feet, knife raised ready for his next move. But he didn't attack again. Instead, he stepped back, blood dripping from the cut on his arm. He tilted his head again, as if amused. Then, in a voice that was barely a whisper, he said, This is my land. I didn't wait for him to make the next move. 
I turned and ran, sprinting through the forest like my life depended on it, because it did. I could hear him behind me, his footsteps pounding the earth as he chased me through the trees. Branches whipped at my face, and the underbrush tore at my clothes, but I didn't stop. I couldn't. My lungs burned, my legs ached, but fear kept me moving. I burst into a clearing near the creek I'd passed earlier, my mind racing for a plan. I could hear him closing in, the steady thud of his boots growing louder. I spotted a fallen tree near the water's edge and dove behind it, crouching low, trying to steady my breathing. Seconds felt like hours as I waited, listening for any sign of him. The forest was silent again, but I knew he was close. I tightened my grip on the knife, every muscle in my body tensed, ready to fight. Then, he appeared at the edge of the clearing, his eyes scanning the area. He moved slowly, methodically, like a predator hunting its prey. I held my breath, praying he wouldn't see me. But he did. In a blur of movement, he was on me. I swung the knife, aiming for his chest, but he caught my wrist mid-air, twisting it until I dropped the blade. Pain shot up my arm as he shoved me to the ground, pinning me beneath his weight. I struggled, kicking and thrashing, but he was too strong. His hand clamped around my throat again, squeezing tighter this time. My vision dimmed, black spots dancing at the edges. I was going to die here, in the middle of nowhere, and no one would ever find me. Desperation fueled me. I reached out blindly, my hand closing around a rock half buried in the dirt. With the last of my strength, I brought it down on his head. The impact reverberated through my arm, and his grip loosened. I hit him again, harder this time, and he fell back, clutching his skull. I scrambled to my feet grabbing the knife as I staggered away from him. He was on his knees now, blood running down his face, but his eyes were still locked on me, filled with a cold, unwavering hatred. I didn't wait to see if he'd get up. I ran. By the time I made it back to my truck, I was drenched in sweat, my hands trembling as I fumbled with the keys. I half expected him to come charging out of the trees but the forest remained still, watching in eerie silence as I peeled out of the clearing and sped down the forest road. I never told anyone what happened out there. Who would believe me? There was no body, no evidence of the man who'd tried to kill me. Just the memory of those cold, hollow eyes, and the knowledge that he was still out there, somewhere, waiting for his next victim. My name is Aidan Sarver, and this happened to me on October 3, 1987, in the dense pine forests of northern Idaho. I was 32 at the time, recently divorced, and had just taken up hiking alone, thinking it'd be the escape I needed from everything unraveling back in my everyday life. There was something about the wilderness that felt like an antidote, a place I could go to feel alive without anyone around, just the trees, the sky and miles of untouched terrain. That fall, I'd started making regular trips out to Sawtooth National Forest. I'd pack light but thorough, carrying only what I'd need to keep myself safe and comfortable for a few nights alone. On that particular Friday, I planned to hike up to a remote lake I'd heard about from another hiker. He'd mentioned it casually as we passed each other on a trail weeks prior. You should check out Leech Lake, he'd said. It's tucked away, real quiet. Beautiful, too. There was a haunted look in his eye when he mentioned it, but I chalked it up to him being one of those types who liked to dramatize their experiences. Still, I was intrigued. So I took off early that morning, loaded up with a small pack, my tent, a bit of food, and, as always, my old Smith & Wesson tucked in a side pocket for reassurance. I'd never needed it before but I figured it was better to have than not. The trail leading up to the lake was overgrown and unmarked, likely a path that hadn't been used much since the season had turned colder. That only made me more excited. I started the hike around noon, figuring I'd reach the lake by late afternoon, set up camp, 
and enjoy a night under the stars. The first part of the trail was calm, just the soft crunch of leaves beneath my boots and the occasional rustle of branches in the breeze. But as the hours passed, the forest seemed to shift in a way I couldn't quite put my finger on. The air got colder, thicker, and a dampness hung in the atmosphere that wasn't there when I started. The light began to dim earlier than usual, even though sunset was still a couple of hours off. Around three, I came across something that gave me pause, a pile of animal bones, scattered, like they'd been tossed by someone or something. They were clean and white, picked dry. I'd come across animal remains before, it wasn't uncommon, especially in these parts. But these bones looked wrong. They were twisted in odd angles, as if broken deliberately. I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't just some animal that had died here. I shrugged it off and kept moving, trying not to dwell on it. As I neared the lake, the silence grew oppressive. There were no birds chirping, no wind rustling the leaves, just a blanket of eerie stillness. I finally reached Leech Lake around four. The water was black as ink, with a thick layer of mist rolling over it, making it nearly impossible to see the other side. Despite the strange atmosphere, I set up my tent by the water's edge, trying to ignore the prickling sensation at the back of my neck. Night fell quickly, and by six, I was sitting by a small fire, trying to keep warm. The lake was beautiful in a haunting way. The moon cast a silvery glow across the mist, creating shadows that danced on the water's surface. I was caught in the beauty of it for a while, forgetting my earlier unease. But that peace didn't last. Around eight, I heard it, a soft splashing sound coming from the lake. At first, I thought it might be an animal, maybe a deer coming to drink. But then the splashes grew louder, more deliberate, like something large was moving in the water. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it across the lake, but the mist was too thick to see more than a few feet in front of me. I called out, Hello? Anyone out there? The splashing stopped. Silence returned, thicker than ever. But now my heart was racing. I sat back down, trying to convince myself it was just my imagination or some animal. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. I tried to shake it off, eat a bit of the trail mix I packed, and focus on the fire, but my nerves were frayed. Not long after, I heard a low, whispering sound. It was so faint I thought it was the wind at first, but as I listened closer, I realized it wasn't. It was words, quiet, incomprehensible, but unmistakably human. I stood up, scanning the trees around me with my flashlight, but the beam of light only cut through a few feet of mist, barely illuminating the dense shadows. Hello? I called again, louder this. Time, my voice trembling despite my effort to keep it steady. Silence. The whispering stopped, replaced by that unbearable stillness. My hand instinctively moved to my side pocket, gripping the handle of my revolver. I'd never had to use it on anything but targets, but that night, every instinct I had told me to be ready. Then came the smell, a sickly, metallic odor that wafted in from the direction of the lake. It reminded me of the scent of blood and decay, a smell that was both familiar and revolting. I gagged, pulling my shirt up over my nose. Whatever was out there was close. The whispers started again, louder now, like someone, or something, was circling my camp, just out of sight. The voice was raspy, distorted, as if speaking through a broken throat. Aiden, it said, drawing my name out in a slow, deliberate tone. My blood ran cold. I hadn't told anyone my plans for this trip, not even my brother. There was no way anyone should know I was here. The whispering grew louder, closer, until I could feel the breath of it on the back of my neck. I spun around, shining the flashlight wildly, but saw nothing. Then, I caught a glimpse of movement near the edge of the lake, a dark figure emerging from the water its shape shifting and unsteady, as if it was struggling to take form. I backed up slowly, drawing my revolver. 
the figure moved toward me with jerking, unnatural steps. It was tall, hunched, its skin an ashen gray, like it had never seen the light of day. Its face was a twisted mess, eyes hollow and black, staring at me with a hunger that went beyond anything I'd ever seen. I fired a shot, the sound echoing through the trees, but the figure didn't stop. It just kept coming, its mouth stretching into an unnatural grin, revealing rows of sharp, jagged teeth. I fired again, and again, until I was out of bullets. Still, it advanced, unfazed, reaching out a skeletal hand toward me. With no other option, I turned and ran, crashing through the trees, my heart pounding so loudly I could barely hear the crunch of leaves beneath my feet. The creature followed, its footsteps heavy and relentless, closing the distance faster than I thought possible. I stumbled over a root, catching myself just in time, but I could feel it getting closer, its cold, fetid breath against my skin. Somehow, I managed to reach a rocky outcrop overlooking the lake. There was nowhere else to go. Trapped, I spun around, picking up a jagged rock from the ground, the only weapon I had left. The creature stood at the edge of the outcrop, its empty eyes fixed on me. It raised one long, bony finger, pointing directly at my chest. Without thinking, I hurled the rock with all my strength, hitting it square in the face. It staggered back, letting out a guttural scream that shattered the silence. For a brief moment, it looked vulnerable, as if the rock had somehow broken its hold on this world. Taking advantage of its hesitation, I scrambled down the other side of the outcrop, sliding through mud and rocks until I reached a dense thicket of trees. I didn't stop running, pushing through branches and undergrowth until my legs burned and my lungs screamed for air. I ran until I couldn't hear the creature's footsteps anymore, until the forest returned to that unnatural stillness. I don't know how long I wandered through those woods, disoriented and terrified, but eventually, I found a trail and followed it back to the main road. When I finally reached my car, I collapsed in relief, my body aching, my mind numb from what I'd just experienced. I never went back to that lake. To this day, I can still hear the whisper of my name in the wind, a haunting reminder of the thing I encountered that night. No one believes me when I tell the story, they say it's just my imagination, a trick of the mind. But I know what I saw. And I know that somewhere, in the dark corners of those woods, that creature is still waiting. I'm Aaron Kessler, and I work as a wildlife researcher. This happened to me on August 7, 1995, while I was deep in the Ozark Mountains, tracking black bears for a seasonal population study. The weather was sweltering that day, the kind of humidity that made the air thick and suffocating. I'd been alone for days, hiking along rugged trails that barely anyone uses anymore. I didn't mind, though, I'm used to solitude, and the peace of the wild always makes the isolation worthwhile. I had set up camp in a small clearing, nestled between the thick trees and a stream that trickled by lazily. It was a good spot, elevated enough to avoid floods, secluded enough to give me the privacy I needed for my research. My tent was pitched, the radio set up for communication back to the ranger station if needed, and my trail cameras were scattered in various spots to capture any signs of bear activity. I've done this dozens of times before but that night felt different. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was a strange energy in the air, almost like the forest was holding its breath. The first odd thing I noticed was the silence. Usually, the woods at night are alive with the sounds of insects, owls, and the occasional rustling of animals. But that night, everything was dead quiet. Not a single chirp, not even the buzz of cicadas just an eerie stillness that made my skin crawl. I told myself it was probably just the heat, animals tend to lie low in this kind of weather, but that explanation felt flimsy. As the hours ticked by, I tried to shake off the unease. I had work to do. My radio crackled occasionally with updates from the ranger station, but I didn't need any help or information. 
After reviewing the day's data and logging my observations, I decided to get some sleep. But as I lay there in my tent, the silence pressed in around me, and I found myself wide awake, staring at the dark ceiling. Then, around midnight, I heard it. At first, it was faint, like the sound of something heavy moving through the underbrush. It was slow and deliberate, almost as if whatever it was didn't care about being quiet. I sat up, listening intently, my hand instinctively reaching for the flashlight by my side. The sound grew louder, closer, until it stopped just beyond my tent. My heart pounded in my chest, but I told myself it was probably a bear, maybe one of the ones I was tracking. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent slowly, trying not to make any sudden movements. As I shined the beam of light into the darkness, I saw nothing at first, just the trees and the undergrowth swaying slightly in the breeze. But then I caught a glimpse of movement, just at the edge of my vision, something tall and hunched over, standing among the trees. It wasn't a bear. It was something else entirely. The figure was grotesque, its skin pale and stretched tight over its bones. Its arms were unnaturally long, almost dragging the ground as it moved slowly through the trees. In its face, it was distorted, with sunken eyes that glowed faintly in the dark. I froze, unable to comprehend what I was looking at. My brain struggled to process it, to rationalize it, but there was no mistaking what I saw. It wasn't human, and it wasn't any animal I'd ever encountered in the wild. For a moment, it just stood there, staring in my direction, as if it was sizing me up. Then, without warning, it let out a low, guttural noise that seemed to vibrate through the ground beneath me. The sound snapped me out of my trance, and I scrambled back into the tent, zipping it shut as if that flimsy piece of fabric would somehow protect me from whatever was out there. I fumbled for my radio, trying to contact the ranger station, but the static was so thick I couldn't get a signal. The creature outside was moving again, circling my camp slowly, deliberately. I could hear the crunch of leaves and the snap of twigs as it moved, and with each step, my panic grew. I wasn't armed, at least, not in any meaningful way. All I had was a small knife for cutting through brush and a flare gun for emergencies. Neither of which would do me much good against whatever that thing was. My only option was to wait it out, to hope it would lose interest and move on. But it didn't. Hours passed and the creature stayed, sometimes moving closer to my tent, other times retreating into the woods, only to return minutes later. I didn't sleep. I couldn't. Every time I thought it might be gone, I'd hear that awful, dragging noise again, like it was taunting me, waiting for the right moment to strike. As dawn approached, I finally heard the sound of birds chirping, and the first rays of sunlight began to filter through the trees. The creature hadn't made a noise in hours, and I dared to hope it had left for good. Exhausted and desperate, I unzipped the tent and stepped out, my legs shaking beneath me. The clearing looked the same as it had the day before, but the air felt different, heavy, like the forest was holding some dark secret. I quickly packed up my gear, glancing over my shoulder every few seconds, expecting to see that pale, distorted face watching me from the trees. But I didn't. I hiked out of there as fast as I could, not stopping until I reached the ranger station later that afternoon. I told them what I'd seen, but they didn't believe me. They said it was probably a bear or some other animal, and that the isolation had gotten to my head. But I know what I saw, and it wasn't a bear. A week later, I heard about a missing hiker in the same area. They never found his body just as pack in some torn clothing. The official report said it was likely an animal attack, but I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever I had seen was responsible. Years have passed since that night, but the memory of that creature still haunts me. I've spent my life in the wilderness, studying animals and tracking predators, but nothing has ever scared me like that thing did. It was unnatural, something that didn't belong in this world. I still go back into the woods, but never alone. Not anymore.
I learned my lesson the hard way. There are things out there, things that don't care about the rules of nature or man. And once they've marked you, they never really let go. Whatever was in those woods that night, I know it's still out there. Waiting. My name is Calvin Merrick, and this happened to me on October 18, 1986, deep in the Washita National Forest in Arkansas. I'm a carpenter by trade, but whenever I get time off, I head straight into the woods. I grew up in those mountains, practically raised by the trails and the trees, with a respect for what lives in the forest that I can't quite explain. Solitude and silence out here, away from the hum of everyday life, have always grounded me. But after that weekend, I can't shake the feeling that I won't be hiking alone again anytime soon. I'd planned a weekend hike on a secluded trail I'd heard about from an old hunting buddy, Clyde Robards. He claimed it was one of the most pristine spots he'd ever hunted, a stretch he described as God's country, tucked away in a valley that even locals rarely ventured into. I knew the area well enough to get there by memory and compass. Clyde had sworn me to secrecy about the place, wanting to keep it safe from casual campers who might ruin it. I left at dawn, intending to get there by late afternoon. As I reached the trailhead, I felt a strange stillness, the kind that usually signals a storm. But the sky was clear. The birds, however, were quiet, and a sort of eerie calm seemed to hang over everything. I chalked it up to early autumn settling in, a time when the forest feels in between, caught somewhere between summer's buzz and winter's sleep. The first few hours passed uneventfully, with nothing more than the crunch of leaves under my boots and the sound of a distant stream. By evening, I'd found a clearing near the edge of a small cliff, where I decided to set up camp. The view was impressive, you could see miles of rolling trees, and the sun cast an orange glow over the landscape. After setting up my tent and starting a small fire, I settled in with a can of beans and some jerky, feeling content and grateful. But then came a sound, just out of earshot, muffled and distant. It was like the hum of a low engine or the rush of wind, but neither quite fit. I'd heard every sound imaginable out here over the years, coyotes, owls, even the odd bear shuffling through the underbrush. This was something else entirely, something that seemed both familiar and alien. I tried to ignore it, telling myself it was just the forest playing tricks on me as it got dark. The sound returned in intervals throughout the night, always just far enough away that I couldn't place it. My unease grew, gnawing at me, and I found myself wide awake, gripping the flashlight beside me. It wasn't just the sound, it was the feeling of being watched. I'm not one for paranoia, but something wasn't right. It was as though the forest itself was holding its breath, waiting for something. Around midnight, the sound stopped, and everything went silent, dead silent. I barely had a chance to relax before something heavy and slow started moving just beyond the firelight. I strained my eyes, peering into the darkness, but saw nothing. Heart pounding, I stood up, flashlight in hand, and scanned the area, sweeping the beam back and forth. The footsteps stopped, but in their place came a low, rattling breath, like someone struggling to breathe, only it sounded, wrong. Each gasp was wet, labored, and filled with a kind of malice that I felt in my bones. I'd heard stories of folks getting stalked by mountain lions, but this wasn't like anything I'd encountered. The shape, too, was wrong, much too large for any animal I'd ever come across in Arkansas. Whatever it was, it stayed just out of reach, circling my camp, moving with an unsettling, measured pace. I wanted to call out, maybe scare it off, but something told me that would be a mistake. It was as though my voice might give it the invitation it was waiting for, a signal that I was willing to engage. Instead, I clutched the hunting knife strapped to my side, hoping that if it came down to it, I'd have the nerve to use it. Hours passed in a tense standoff, neither of us moving closer. Eventually, exhaustion got the best of me, and I nodded off, knife still gripped in my hand. When I awoke, 
The sun was beginning to rise, casting the forest in a pale, gray light. The clearing was empty, and there was no sign of any disturbance. Part of me wanted to brush it off as a vivid nightmare, but deep down, I knew better. There was something out here. I decided to press on, hoping that putting some distance between me and whatever had visited my camp would help settle my nerves. But the deeper I went, the stronger the feeling grew, as if I were being led somewhere against my will. By midday, I stumbled upon something that made my blood run cold, a small clearing littered with carcasses. Deer, raccoons, even a black bear lay scattered, each one with deep, precise slashes across its body, like it had been mauled by some twisted version of a predator. The flesh was rotting, but the smell was unlike anything I'd ever encountered. It was sweet. Sickly, with a sharp tang that caught in my throat. As I stood there, transfixed by the horrific sight, I felt that same presence closing in. I spun around, knife drawn, just in time to see a shape dart between the trees, fast, impossibly fast, like a shadow come to life. I couldn't make out details, only that it was tall, with limbs that seemed too long, too thin. And the eyes, two pinpricks of pale yellow, staring at me with a strange intelligence, as if it were sizing me up, deciding whether to finish what it had started. Fear gave way to a cold, calculated need to survive. I started backing away, never taking my eyes off those twin lights, which seemed to follow me, mirroring my every step. I reached for my pack, fumbling for the flare gun I'd packed more as an afterthought. It was the only weapon I had that might scare whatever this thing was. My hands shook as I loaded a flare and aimed at the creature. In a burst of red light, the forest lit up, and I caught my first full glimpse of it. The creature was humanoid but twisted, its limbs too thin and elongated, skin stretched tight and pale as bone. Its face was sunken, a void where a mouth should have been, but it was the eyes that held me, the empty, hungry look of something that didn't belong in this world. The flare startled it, sending it darting back into the shadows, but I knew it wasn't gone. It was waiting, testing my resolve. I took off, sprinting down the trail, my heart pounding in my ears. Every so often, I'd hear a rustling behind me, just out of sight, as it matched my pace, letting me know I couldn't outrun it. As dusk settled, I knew I couldn't keep up this pace much longer. My legs ached, lungs burning from the exertion, but I had to stay sharp. Every few yards, I'd pause, skim the trees, and press on, hoping to lose it in the dense forest. But every time I stopped, I'd catch a glimpse of those yellow eyes, floating just out of reach, never closer, but never far enough. I stumbled upon a creek and, without thinking, splashed across to the other side, hoping the water might throw it off. When I looked back, the creature had halted at the edge of the creek, head tilted, watching me with what looked almost like, curiosity. It didn't cross, just stood there, motionless. With my pulse racing and my options running out, I knew I couldn't keep running forever. I was exhausted, and whatever this thing was, it was just biding its time. I had one flare left, but I doubted it would scare the creature off for good. I needed to confront it, here and now, before it wore me down to nothing. I moved away from the creek and into a dense cluster of trees, using the foliage as cover. It was risky, but I hoped the thick trunks would limit the creature's movements, maybe slow it down enough for me to get the upper hand. I crouched low, breathing as quietly as possible, and waited. Minutes felt like hours as I listened to the eerie silence. My heartbeat echoed in my ears, and the forest felt like it was closing in, every branch and leaf holding its breath along with me. Then, I saw it. Those yellow eyes glinted between the trees, closing in slowly, deliberately. It moved with a dreadful grace, its limbs bending in ways that defied nature, like a marionette on invisible strings. I waited until it was within a few yards, until I could see the unnatural stretch of its limbs, the tight, pale skin wrapped around its frame. I gripped my knife, knowing it was a long shot, but it was all I had. 
The creature paused, sensing me, and in that split second, I fired the flare. The red burst of light illuminated the creature fully this time, and I saw every horrific detail, the gaunt face, the sharp, angular limbs, the hollow sockets where its eyes should have been. It let out a shuddering hiss, recoiling from the sudden light, and I seized the moment. I lunged forward, aiming for the creature's neck, hoping to hit something vital. My knife sank into its flesh, but it felt wrong, like slicing through sinew and dried leather rather than skin. It let out a chilling, guttural wheeze and swiped at me, its claws catching my shoulder. Pain seared through me, but I held on, twisting the blade deeper. The creature thrashed, its movements frantic and wild. I felt its claws digging into my arm, tearing through fabric and skin, but adrenaline drowned out the pain. I yanked the knife free, stumbling backward as it staggered, clutching at its wound with long, bony fingers. The flare was still burning on the ground, casting flickering shadows over the clearing, and I could see it struggling, weakened by the wound. Without hesitating, I grabbed a nearby branch, thick and heavy, and swung it with everything I had. The wood cracked against the creature's skull, a sickening sound that reverberated through my arms. It let out a choked screech, staggering backward, its thin limbs buckling under its weight. I swung again, this time aiming for its neck, and the impact sent it sprawling to the ground. The creature lay there, writhing in the dim light, its form crumpling like a discarded rag. Its limbs twitched, but it was slowing down, each movement weaker than the last. I stood over it, panting, the branch still clenched in my hands. Its eyes, or the hollows where they should have been, stared up at me, filled with a silent rage that chilled me to the core. I took one last look, feeling a strange mix of horror and triumph, then swung the branch down with a final, brutal force. The creature's body went still, lifeless. I staggered backward, dropping the branch, my breath ragged and shallow. It was over. I'd won, but the forest felt different, darker, heavier, as if the trees themselves had borne witness to something they'd rather forget. I turned, limping back toward the creek, clutching my bleeding shoulder and silently vowing that I'd never set foot in that part of the forest again. I'm Aaron Dempsey, and I work as a wildlife photographer. This happened to me on November 3, 1991, when I decided to take a break from my usual work in the Smoky Mountains and head out west to the Bitterroot Range of Montana. I needed some time alone, a chance to clear my head and focus on something different. It was just me, my camera, and the silence of the wilderness, exactly what I thought I needed. I've always been the kind of guy who enjoys his solitude, and as a photographer, I've spent countless hours by myself, waiting for that perfect shot. But this time, I got more than I bargained for. I rented a small, isolated cabin deep in the forest, far from the nearest town. The location was perfect for wildlife photography, dense forests, snow-capped peaks in the distance, and plenty of wildlife to capture on film. The cabin was rustic, no electricity, just a wood stove and a kerosene lamp for light. The kind of place that, in retrospect, felt like it was made to make someone feel truly alone. The first couple of days went by smoothly. I spent my mornings hiking the surrounding trails, setting up my camera in hidden spots, hoping to catch a glimpse of wolves or maybe even a bear. By noon, I'd trek back to the cabin, eat something simple, and review my shots. It was peaceful, almost too peaceful. It wasn't until the third day that things started to feel off. I was on a trail about four miles from the cabin, following the edge of a narrow creek that snaked through the forest. The weather had shifted that day, and a heavy fog had rolled in, making the woods feel claustrophobic. The temperature had dropped, and I could see my breath hanging in the air. I remember stopping for a moment to adjust my camera when I heard the sound of branches snapping in the distance. At first, I thought it was just a deer, maybe a moose. But the sound kept getting closer, and it didn't feel like an animal anymore. 
The steps were too slow, too deliberate. I stood still, listening, my heart pounding a little faster with each second that passed. I didn't see anything, though, just the thick fog in the shadows of trees. After a few minutes, the sound stopped altogether, and I convinced myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. That night, back at the cabin, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had been watching me out there. I brushed it off, telling myself I was being paranoid. I mean, the forest was full of sounds, animals, wind, maybe even other hikers. But the unease lingered, gnawing at the back of my mind. On the fourth day, the weather worsened. A storm was brewing, and the winds howled through the trees, rattling the windows of the cabin. I decided to stay close to the cabin that day, figuring I'd wait out the storm before heading deeper into the forest again. I spent the day inside, going over my photographs, trying to relax. But something felt wrong. Around dusk, I heard it again, the sound of footsteps outside the cabin. Heavy, slow, deliberate steps, crunching through the snow. My first thought was that it might be another hiker, maybe someone lost in the storm, but there was something about the way the steps paused every few seconds, as if the person was listening, or watching. I grabbed my jacket and cautiously opened the door, peering into the fading light. The wind whipped through the trees, and the snow swirled around me, but there was no one there. I stepped outside, looking around the cabin, but all I saw were faint tracks in the snow, leading away from the cabin and disappearing into the trees. I didn't sleep much that night. Every sound, every gust of wind had me on edge, and I kept imagining those footsteps circling the cabin. By morning, the storm had passed, but the unease remained. On the fifth day, I decided I needed to head back to town. I packed up my gear, loaded it into my truck, and started the drive down the narrow dirt road that led back to the highway. The road was slick with snow and ice, and I had to drive slowly to avoid skidding off into the trees. About halfway down, I spotted something on the side of the road. At first, I thought it was a deer, but as I got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. It was a man, or what was left of him. His body was twisted in an unnatural position, half buried in the snow, his clothes torn and bloodied. His face was frozen in a look of terror, eyes wide open, staring into nothing. I slammed on the brakes, my heart racing as I scrambled out of the truck to get a closer look. The man had been savaged, deep gashes ran across his chest and arms, as if he'd been attacked by something with claws but what really unnerved me was the fact that there were no tracks in the snow around him. No footprints, no signs of struggle. It was as if he'd been dropped there from the sky. I grabbed my camera, snapping a few quick shots before realizing how absurd it was. This wasn't something I wanted to remember. I had to call the authorities. But as I reached into my pocket for my cell phone, I cursed myself. There was no signal this deep in the woods. Panic set in. I jumped back into the truck and sped down the road, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly they hurt. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. Who was that man? What had happened to him? And why were there no tracks? I made it to the small ranger station near the highway, stumbling inside and breathlessly telling the ranger what I'd found. His face went pale as he listened, and he immediately radioed for backup. While we waited, he asked me to show him where I'd seen the body. Reluctantly, I agreed, and we headed back up the road in his jeep. When we arrived at the spot, the body was gone. The snow was undisturbed, as if nothing had ever been there. I couldn't believe it, I had seen it, I had the photos to prove it. I fumbled with my camera flipping through the pictures, but when I reached the spot where the body should have been, there was nothing. Just blank frames, the images completely erased. The ranger looked at me like I was losing it, but I knew what I had seen. I tried to explain, but the more I talked, the more ridiculous it sounded. A body that just disappeared, 
No tracks. No proof. It sounded like something out of a bad movie. We drove back to the station in silence, and I spent the rest of the day in a daze, trying to make sense of what had happened. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that man's face, twisted in fear. I decided I wasn't going to stay in the cabin anymore. I packed up my things the next morning and left, not looking back. But even now, years later, I can't shake the feeling that something was out there in those woods. Something that wasn't human. Something that was watching me, waiting. I never went back to the Bitterroot Range, and I never told anyone about what happened. Who would believe me? But every now and then, when I'm alone in the woods, I hear those footsteps again, and I wonder if it's still out there, watching, waiting for its next victim.